Okay, thank you and welcome everybody to today's meeting of Planning Committee B. Uh, my name is Councillor Hollier, I'll be chairing the committee this evening. Uh, we've got quite a lot of public speakers this today, so I will sort of run through a bit more of the process uh, than perhaps we normally do. But you'll see down both sides of the table, we've got the rest of the committee. Uh, at the top end, we've got a, a mixture of um, planning officers, legal officers, uh, democracy officers. Uh, and I'll just ask them to introduce themselves when they first speak, just so everybody knows who's uh, who we've got around the table. Um, we've got a couple of apologies today. So the first is from Councillor Craghill, who's substituted by Councillor de Gorn. Uh, and then we've got apologies from Councillor Galvin as well, who hasn't sent a substitute. Um, firstly, as well, I'll just... Thank you. I'll just give my thanks as well to everybody both public speakers, members of the public and the committee, as well as well as the officers uh, for bearing with us. Obviously, there's been a few issues getting this meeting uh, off the ground, shall we say. So we're all very glad glad to be here now, but thank you for, for bearing with us a little bit through, the, through that period. Um, in terms of the procedure, we've got four items on the agenda this evening. We'll start with an update on each item from council officers. Uh, there'll then be an opportunity for members of the committee to ask questions on the plans they've seen specifically uh, rather than general questions. And if we could try and keep it uh, mostly to the plans, that would be appreciated. Uh, we'll then hear from our public speakers. Uh, and there are quite a few public speakers, so we'll need to try and keep it to, to three minutes uh, for each speaker. Uh, after each speaker, there'll be an opportunity for members of the committee to ask uh, speakers any questions of clarification they need answering. Uh, following that, we'll have uh, questions on everything we've heard so far to the officers. Uh, there'll then be an opportunity for the for members of the committee to debate what they've heard, uh, and then we'll move towards uh, a decision and a vote. Um, I'll just remind committee members as well that in line with our new constitution, uh, we'll be looking for um, an initial motion to move the sorry the council officers. Uh, recommendations rather than in the past where we've sort of taken any uh, motion from the floor uh, in line with the new constitution we will need to look at the council officers recommendations first if then we could move on to any declarations of interest uh councillor oral thank you chair uh personal non-prejudicial interest i know mr ferguson who is one of the speakers okay councillor fisher a similar personal non prejudicial I worked with Barry Ferguson for rather many more years than I remember, but I'm not pretty determined on that application. Okay, Councillor de Gorn. Um, two, two, uh, two items to mention. Um, firstly, one of the speakers, this is at, both in relation to item 4B, uh, Clifton Junior School. Um, I uh, know personally Andy Dearden, who's speaking in, in objection. Um, I also uh, note that the application relates to outline proposal for residential development, uh, and my partner is executive member for housing, um, but I'm prepared to keep an open mind, listen to the debate in terms of making my mind up on how I vote on, on that item, so I don't consider that to be prejudicial. Okay. Any further declarations? I can't see any. So if we could move on then uh, to the minutes of the last meeting. The only issue I could see was that Councillor Daugney um, was missed off the list of those present, although he wasn't present. He'd given his apologies and Councillor Fenton was substituting for him. Um, so I think if that could be amended. Um, but if there are any other issues with the minutes, members could indicate. Otherwise, I'm happy to sign those after the meeting. Next, then, we've got the general public participation section of the meeting, and we've got one speaker that's Councillor Waters. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'm speaking in objection to agenda item 4D. 
As ever, it's an objection in principle to any form of expansion of the suburban campus in residential areas that the application represents. But in this particular case, I fail to understand how this application can be determined. And if it is, refusal is the only consistent decision to be reached. I hope committee is fully aware of recent refusals upheld at appeal of HMO expansion proposals at Badger Hill, 29 and 41 Derrimore Drive, the most recent. Planning inspectors upholding refusals made on the basis of inadequate parking arrangements. The application at 36 Farndale Avenue seeks permission via some hideous extensions to increase occupancy of this existing HMO to six bedrooms. The bare minimum of parking spaces is three. From the planning file, 9th of August, Highways Development Control expressed serious concerns of the ability of three vehicles to manoeuvre and park on the frontage. Seemingly, the planning officer ignored those comments when writing up this draft report, which amazingly has made its way into the agenda in front of you. I queried this and Highways Development Control have responded on the 11th of October with similarly strong comments. To avoid a similar situation to the one just round the corner where a student HMO was approved by yourselves, where it was physically impossible for two cars, let alone three, to park and manoeuvre, resulting in two displaced cars on the public highway, you should be deferring a decision on 36 Farndale Avenue tonight and requesting proper consideration of highway development control comments by the planning officer and a consistent approach by City of York Council, like the Badger Hill decisions for HMO parking standards. Should you go ahead and determine this application, though, refusal is the only consistent decision you can make. But given the enthusiasm of members of this committee for approval of similar applications in Osborne in recent years, I'd like to point out condition four. There is absolutely no compulsion created by this condition for bin or bike storage to actually be used. On previous approvals, bin stores located out of sight aren't used as the occupants can't be bothered with bins and that results in bins and rubbish left on frontages and the public highway. Such conditions need rewording so enforcement can be taken. The informative on verge protection is what I term chocolate fire guard legislation. If this application is approved, the verge and footpath outside will be trashed and not one penny piece will be recovered in cost. Given the parking impacts of builders, vehicles and deliveries, a dilapidation survey should be carried out to all similar applications prior to building works. Otherwise, the informative should stop being written in. Thank you for your time, Chair. Thank you. Chair, do we not get to ask questions because it's in the general email? No, 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 no. Okay, if we can move on then to the plans list proper. Hopefully everybody's aware that we're moving on to item 4B. We had a request prior to the meeting uh, due to officer availability. Um, so if we can move on to item 4B, please. Chair, just before we begin this item, could I just formally move on? I'd just like to formally record that I don't believe that Councillor de Gaunt should be taking part in this determination. Uh, I believe that as an executive member, he shouldn't be taking part on an application that's brought on behalf of the City of York Council, particularly when it is Council policy to be expanding a library. Furthermore, his partner being the executive member for housing in this application having a significant element of it being about the delivery of council housing. Um, I also feel that that's a conflict um, and it's with regret that um, I see that he's not uh, withdrawing. Um, I think it would be in the public interest for him to do so. Okay, noted. Can we move on to item 4B? Thank you, Chair. So this is a, a planning application at the former Clifton Without County Junior School on Rawcliffe Drive. Um, it's, a, it's a hybrid application, so partly in full uh, and part outline. Uh, full details of uh, part demolition of the former school buildings, the erection of a two-storey block and single-storey extension for a new library and associated uses, uh, and then external works, including car park, terrace, play areas and a pedestrian and cycle access to the adjacent school. And then there are outline proposals for residential development. So on the, on the screen, you show the, uh, shows the 
current uh, layout of the site of the former school buildings, the red line, uh, proposed access so on the side of the uh, on the side of the site on the fairway. Some photographs. So this is um, Rawcliffe Drive and Rawcliffe Lane, former school buildings. Uh, I mentioned it was part demolition. This uh, central hall section is one of the parts of the building that's to be retained. It's a view um, towards a uh, fairway from inside the site's former school uh, playground, hard surface playground, car park. It's an existing hedge facing um, fairway, which is a, a residential street um, of largely two-story semi-detached dwellings. Site layout plan. So the retained section at Central Hall is here. There's the other retained section of the existing building here. Um, the access to the Vale of York Academy along the side. Uh, retained existing car park. The new car park with its access from Rawcliffe Drive. And then the area of the uh, housing site to the south of the site. Elevations, so proposed north and south elevations. Again, you'll see the retained buildings or section of buildings here. And the retained buildings there. Yeah, so the north elevation, and the south elevation, and then this two-story block of new build and the connecting structures is a single story. East and west elevations and cross sections. And then the ground floor plan for so the main library area um, in the in the retained um, central hall extended out into the new build, um, classrooms and ancillary accommodation. And then first floor, classrooms and activity rooms and meeting rooms, IT room, circulation, toilets. Um, aerial photograph. So there's a central hall. The other retained section, this is Fairway, Wilcliffe Lane, Wilcliffe Drive, uh, the hedge, which is uh, behind a, a, a wide um, verge, which is uh, characteristic of the characteristic of the whole um, of the whole street, um, an area of trees. Um, And that's the end of the presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Members have questions on the on the presentation. You want me to go back to any of those images? Just clicking on the chat. That's a close one. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, from the photograph, are you able to identify which? Because there, there's a variety of different tree categories aren't there there's this category a b and c are we able to identify which of the category a and b trees to be retained it's all of them in the foreground of the picture the category c trees are the the, the japanese cherries uh, adjoining it's rawcliffe drive and are those the category C trees to be removed, or yes. are they? Yeah. Okay. okay. We do have a uh, sorry, Councillor De Gaulle as well. Sorry, can you point to the location of the um, footpath to the school on that, which is referenced in the report? Yeah. Okay. 
And um, just going back to that drawing, so it's shown here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further? Yeah, we can go back to the yes, update. Sorry. So we do have a written update in front of members. Um, Eric, if you could go through that, it's largely based on the uh, on the conditions and updating the conditions. I shall go through and highlight the specific items. Uh, it, firstly, we seek delegated authority to officers to amend conditions 5, 16 to 19, 25 and 26 to clarify the trigger points for the condition. This arises from the, uh, the uh, proposal being a hybrid uh, part full part outline. Uh, fo focus on condition 7. Uh, that is to be amended to read referencing all trees identified within the application site identified in the Rosetta Landscape Design Tree Survey as being category A or category B. That is, except the Japanese, apologies for the, the further typo, cherry kanzan specimens shall be retained as part and parcel of the finished layout. They are the two trees I just identified on Rawcliffe Drive. On condition 24, uh, clarify that the parallel crossing is for cycles and pedestrians. Turning over the page, uh, condition 28 references a uh, surface water discharge rate for the new library of 24 litres per second and 5 litres per second from the housing site in terms of surface water drainage, which was a matter of concern latterly. There are a few new conditions. Uh, in I highlight specifically condition 32, and I will read that through in its entirety. Prior to the commencement of development, a detailed management plan to secure the retention of the hedge bounding the site adjoining the fairway outside of the approved pedestrian cycle access to Vale of York Academy shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. The management plan shall include measures to secure the hedge, including appropriate fencing and measures for replacement of any hedging which dies or is removed without the permission of the local planning authority. No part of the hedge shall be removed unless permission is granted either by details approved under this condition or pursuant to the reserved matters for the routing of services, runs or access points. Condition 32. Uh, follows on from condition seven that identifies seek is to give protection to canopy and root protection area of any tree identified as being category A or B in the Rosetta landscape design tree survey dated March 2022. Condition 33 clarifies seeks clarification of the details of cycle parking for the residential element of the development with the reserved matter submission. And condition 34 seeks the submission of formal approval of a LEMP or landscape and ecological management plan seeking the preservation and enhancement of the biodiversity value of the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think then we can move on to our public speakers. Our first uh, speaker, Mr. Andy Dearden. You're able to join us at the table, please. Chair, sure. have the public speakers had access to these um, updates and additional recommended conditions? Because I think some of what was going to be spoken about is addressed in some of this. I think they're tabled. No, they're not meeting. circulated. They're tabled for members at the meeting. Thank you. If you're able to, to start in your own time, as you know, you've got three minutes and I'll okay. give you a warning at about 30 seconds to go. OK, Thank you. well, I hope that the committee members have used the numerous delays to read the paperwork, look at the objections in detail, visit the site and understand the issues. Now, I want to focus on the public paperwork because I haven't seen the, the latest conditions. If you look at page 43, para 3.2, the landscape team, Objection is however made to the proposal, which would likely require removal of the boundary hedge adjacent to fairway. Page 44, para 3.6. Clifton without parish council 
object to the proposal on the grounds of the potential loss of the hedge. For information, a petition to protect the hedge made to the executive meeting in January attracted over 500 signatures in seven days. Page 45, para 4.1, objection to the loss of any hedge fronting onto the fairway with a minimum of 100 meters retained. That's, that's the sort of summary of the comments. What's missing is a specific mention of a condition that I suggested that could be applied to retain a minimum amount of hedgerow. Now, it sounds as if something is being done here. It's something that needs to be applied at outline stage. I don't think it's something that you can bring in at the detailed stage. And I was hoping that officers would give you advice on whether my suggestion was, was workable. At the moment, the application shows access to the housing site from fairway. And if you can't come up with a way of defending the hedge uh, explicitly in the conditions, then I suggest you just delete the access from fairway. Page 47, para 5.7 says, the section of the site proposed for housing comprises the former hard play area of the school. Well, I'm sorry, that's economic with the truth. The majority of the green space on that site, if you go back to the photograph, the hedge, the major trees, and the school's wildlife garden is in that kind of unimaginative housing rectangle. It does say in 5.7, it's therefore recommended that any permission is conditioned to secure vehicular access route with associated service runs away from the line of a hedge. It's 30 seconds left. Right, but that disappears when you get to page 51 and para seven, it's, it wasn't there. Officers suggest you use biodiversity net gain, but that's based on an ecological appraisal, which is inaccurate and self-contradictory. You set such a low bar, you'll get a poor result. The word hedge doesn't appear anywhere within those recommendations. Either specify a condition that explicitly protects the hedge or remove that arrow that indicates site access is permitted from fairway. Okay, that's time, thank you. Thank you. If you just bear with us a second. There might be some questions from the committees. I'll just ask if there are. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for coming this evening. Um, so you said you'd put a petition forward with 500 signatories to executive, presumably when they took the decision to expand yes. on the site. Um, so that petition, was that calling for, because we haven't seen the wording of that okay. petition, was it calling for the complete protection of the hedge or if you could just I don't, tell us what it said, that would be really yeah. helpful. <laughs> I don't have Wi-Fi access to go back to change.org for, for what was there, but it was to, to save the hedge um, because it's part of a wildlife corridor. So the key thing was to save the hedge. It didn't explicitly set this 100 meters thing. The, the suggestion of 100 meters was something that we came up when we were thinking about, well, okay, how can you still do the housing here and, and actually meet the city's housing need, but actually work with this site? And where, you, where the car park is sitting at the moment, is, is using up lots of uh, brownfield site, and then you're putting lots of green, you're taking lots of green space and putting the housing there. And between the trees, if you think about the area between those trees and the outside space of the library, there isn't enough space there to put any housing. That's a kind of ideal place to put a car park. So okay. actually just, Sorry, you know, we, we would if you could draw... so hard to be constructive. Sorry, if you, yeah. thank you. Try and keep answers a little short. Any further questions? All right, thank you for your time this evening. Yep, so next we've got a, a written submission from um, Caroline did and that's I've been asked to read out, uh, which I will do. Uh, so these are the words of Caroline Deard. And since August 2021, despite residents constructively engaging with the consultation process, 
None of our suggestions have been accepted and the plan remains essentially the same. The play area was in the control of the parish council and not CYC. The officers of the council seem to have a, this will do, let's get it through approach, with no interest in how this plan could be so much better. To retain what is already special about this site, we urge the committee to protect the hedge on fairway. This is now threatened by an ecological appraisal containing, containing a number of inaccuracies and contradictions. To correct two of them, the hedge is part of a continuous wildlife corridor from Clifton Ings to Clifton Back East and is not isolated, i.e. it does not have a 20 metre gap to another hedge at either end. Also, it is species rich. A number of plant species were missed off the appraisal, a list of which has been identified in one of the objections. The corridor is regularly used by hedgehogs and endangered species. They hibernate in gardens on Moulton Way and Fairway. Holes in fences are not always sufficient as these can easily be blocked and don't replace an 80 year old continuous linear hedge. A petition to save the hedge drew 500 plus local signatures in seven days. Finally, for many residents, this is the first time they have ever tried to make a difference when faced with this type of bureaucracy and perhaps officers view this as an inconvenience. But if you have any belief in the democratic system and you welcome ordinary people feeling that they have a role in conserving their local environment, then we are asking you to show us that this consultation has not simply been a tick box exercise. Otherwise, we face the grim prospect of a central government that ignores ordinary people and possibly a local council that does the same. So by protecting the hedge, you could send a clear signal that people's voices actually do matter and it is worth them engaging in the democratic process. Thank you. Okay. So our next public speaker is Helen Sweeting. And yes, if you're able to join us. And similarly, I'll give you a warning. It's about 30 seconds to go, but yeah, if you'd like to make a start in your own time. Okay, so firstly, I would like to start by saying um, how much everybody is looking forward to and welcoming the new Explore Library that will be based on the old Clifton Rawcliffe Junior School site. This community hub will be greatly benefited by all age groups within this area and beyond. However, we have great concerns over how the site will eventually look and function and feel that we're selling the site short in reaching its full potential. It's important to get this right and, and many have a vision for a better way. We understand the importance of how the housing development will fund the library, but we struggle to understand the fact that this amazing area of green space that includes a hedgerow, a spinney, that's a collection of trees, and a grass verge, holding qualities of a pocket park. It is at great risk of being ripped out and replaced with bricks and concrete. The hedge, the spinney and grass verge are a beautiful feature of the street and area and has been appreciated since the 1940s. It is also on the edge of a conservation area that should be protected and respected. Everyone living within this area or passing through really enjoys this green space with its therapeutic sensory properties of colour, shape, space, peace and wildlife. Evidence of this appreciation was a petition to save the hedge earlier this year with well over 500 signatures. I think it would be vandalism if this is destroyed. So a way to protect this very special area would be for apartments to be built for the elderly and supportive living rather than houses, giving easy access to amenities that the library will offer. With some imagination and vision, I feel this can be done. However, this will require revisiting the site layout and location of the car park. The current way the site is divided between the library and the long thin rectangle for the housing really restricts the kind of housing development that can be done. That rectangle lends itself only to a boring line of houses facing onto fairway and therefore ripping out most of the hedge. If the officers and the executive just rethink the way that this site is laid out, there are many more creative options available while still preserving what's best about this site and realizing that the space has capacity and potential uh, and more potential than first thought. 30 seconds. I've done, okay. thank you. Thank you, if you just bear with us then, I'll just ask if the committee have got any questions. No, okay. Thank you for your time this evening, thank you. Uh, next we've got Anne Le Leonard. Thank you.
Yeah, we should be on now. Yeah, and if you'd like to make a start in your own time, and yes, apologies, Sorry? but I'll, if you'd like to make a start in your own time, and yes, apologies, but I will try and give you a warning in about 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, good. My proposal follows on from something that Helen just said. It's the suggestion that we should include purpose built housing for older people on the former school site, now being developed as a library and housing. The suggestion addresses several very important issues. The fact of our aging population and the dearth of creative ideas about appropriate responses. The general housing shortage, especially affordable family housing. The crisis in social care for the elderly. The suggestions that we're making would ensure a fuller utilization as well of the new library facilities. By providing appropriate housing for older people, family housing would be freed up for younger families. Appropriate housing for older people postpones the need for more intensive elderly care by prolonging self-sufficiency. And there is a great care crisis in this country at the moment. Potentially, the community activities in the library would both benefit the older residents of the scheme and be more fully utilized as a result. So the integration of older people into the wider society would be promoted with benefits for all, reducing the potential isolation of older people and delaying the need for more intensive care in segregated settings. And it provides a broader clientele for library facilities. It's also possible to see in the development over the course of time, links between the Vale of York Academy and housing for older, pe older people in housing for older people. There's the gaps between the generations just seem to get wider and to have a school on the site there with the potential interaction between older residents and the school. I can think, as an ex-teacher, I can think of all sorts of ways in which that would be possible. The other thing is, could this provide a model for future housing developments? Could York once more become a pioneer of social initiatives, housing initiatives to address specific housing need. There has been a reputation in York through the Joseph Browntree um, initiatives and the Joseph Browntree Foundation of um, innovative housing developments. It would be good at this juncture when so much seems to be fading away to reinvigorate that aspect of our society. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just hang on a second, I'll just oh, ask sorry. if the uh, committee have any questions. I can't see any. So thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. Next then, if um, we could have Richard um, Jin. Thank you. Hello. I think it's still on. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to make a start in your own time. It's... Okay. <clears throat> the problem with this proposal from the start has been the shape of the housing area and the threat that it poses to the hedge and verge on fairway and what it means for traffic flows. You've been given preliminary ecological appraisals that, contain, that contradicts itself and contains factual errors. It provides a table of habitats found on the site that says there are no hedgerows hedgerows on the site. It claims the hedge is not species rich and the hedge is isolated, but both of these are incorrect. It actually forms part of a wildlife corridor that runs from Clifton Ings to Clifton Backies, and every section of the hedge is species rich, with five or more native woody, woody species. <clears throat> the appraisal mentions the importance of hedges for wildlife, including butterflies, moths, and other pollinators but concludes that the hedge is not ecologically valuable, despite the surveyors observing many birds that are on the UK red and amber lists. This appraisal is not fit for purpose. 
If the hedge and the grass verge are not retained and replaced by new houses and driveways, this creates a real problem for any kind of traffic flows associated with a new school entrance. Extra traffic associated with people leaving for work and parents dropping off children would create a safety issue due to increased volumes of traffic in a very restricted space. Cars driving the whole length of the fairway to turn around, the 20 mile an hour limit is ignored by many already and parking across new driveways could be an issue, restricting visibility and forcing drivers and cyclists to weave around them. This would all be occurring at a time with lots of children arriving on foot or bicycle from multiple directions. The cycling habits of some of the pupils also leave a great deal to be desired. This all adds increased risk. It can be difficult as it is getting out of fairway in the morning due to traffic. This would only make matters worse. Many people choose to walk or cycle via fairway because it, because it is a fairly quiet street with lots of greenery and these proposals as is would drastically reduce both of these positive aspects of sustainable transport. By retaining the hedge and putting the vehicular access to the new homes off Royal Cliff Drive via the library car park would be much more, would make seconds. this much more mitigated. So we are not against a development, it is just how it is laid out is the real issue that we have. We're, we're we're very, very happy to have the new library and obviously the housing, which is paying for it. But as has been pointed out by, by my fellow residents, it's the actual layout and how that impacts upon the hedgerow that we have real concerns about. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Councillor Crawshaw. <clears throat> thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks for coming this evening. Um, there's a couple of questions if I, I just wanted to sort of try and bottom out a little bit. So um, the access points on fairway as they're proposed at the moment, there's this cycle path sort of new access. So that punches through a bit of hedgerow, yeah. is that? And um, there's then this potential um, access onto the site, which I presume would be a, a, a vehicular access onto the site. The, so, the way it's written, it seems, you know, it, it could be one access, it could be... 10 access points mm. the way it's written you know gives no real protection at all to the hedge so so if it's a single one maybe but by bringing the vehicular access from raw cliff drive through the car park of the library you're then protecting the entirety of the hedge and that gives protecting the ecology of it and also provides a much more pleasant aspect not only for residents but also for the people that are going to be living in the new housing there as well so it's a win-win situation for everybody because it then gives a far far nicer aspect to the entire project and by reimagining how you lay out the housing there whether you know whether it's social housing sheltered housing whatever it may be it will provide a much much more pleasant environment for everybody while protecting the environment and also maintaining you know the integrity of the hedge and the verge there and also helping to mitigate extra traffic on fairway which can be quite quick you know and i as a parent of a young child i'm very concerned about that uh, that's really helpful because you, you sort of answered the question before I got to the question, which was which was uh, great. Um, so that's that's really helpful in understanding that. The, the other aspect, um, if I may share that, I just wanted to um, understand as well is because I think yourself and a couple of the other speakers have, have talked a little bit about um, protecting the green space on the site. And from the, the photographs, I, I believe there's a kind of a green area in the bottom right. Um, so we've got the trees marked there and then and then to the right hand is that's yeah. all current so green area as well. The, the bottom left is where that's tarmac and then it, there's sort of tarmac part of the way and then a lot a lot of the right hand side as I'm looking is the uh, is green. And, and the, so would you, would your hope be that there would be a way of protecting <laughs> that green because I, I, we've heard already that the, the trees have yeah. to be protected now under this yeah. condition yeah if the, if the trees are being protected that's obviously going to be limiting uh the available space for any housing which then makes the the bottom left the more viable option for putting your housing and then having maybe a a 
strip of parking running parallel to the to the library boundary uh, for your car parking. And depending on the, on the type of housing that you go for, you know, if it's sheltered housing, you know, they're unlikely to be uh, a lot of cars from residents. It will more be visitors and carers. Uh, if it's social housing, there will be more parking. But, you know, that is obviously within your remit. Um, so we would like to see as much of the green retained because it will be a benefit for everybody, not just the residents of Fairway, but the new residents of Fairway, which will be in that proposed housing site. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next is sorry the next speaker we've got is Sarah Garbach uh, who's the chief operating officer of York Explore yeah if you'd like to make a start in your own time and I'll, I'll give you a warning at about 30 seconds Okay, thank you. I'm here representing Explore York Libraries and Archives as we're contracted to deliver the Library and Archives service on behalf of the Council. Uh, and we're really excited to be here in support of a planning application to develop the former Clifton Without Junior School into a new Explore Centre for the community. Our vision is all about working with communities to create safe, accessible, welcoming, warm spaces that meet the needs of everyone. We work with people to design flexible spaces that change and adapt to the needs of the individual. That might be to suit the person who needs one-to-one -one free digital support to help get a job, or the person who wants to come to see a high quality cultural performance on their doorstep. This development really allows us to do much more than we can currently do in the existing building. It's a bigger library, so there'll be more books, we'll have more PCs to help bridge the digital divide and give access to PCs for people who haven't got them at home. We'll have free Wi-Fi wi throughout so people can pop in and do work and also a change in places facility to support people with severe physical accessibility needs. We'll have a reading cafe offering a lovely space for people to meet up with friends and relax. Meeting rooms with decent tech so people can hire them out as quality meeting spaces and also specific spaces for children and young people uh, that they will have a hand in designing. Our vision includes working with partner organisations, working with us and with one another to enable us all to do more and to benefit one another and our customers. Our partners at Clifton Explore include Snappy, Accessible Arts and Media and York Learning, and we've been listening to their voices and collaborating closely with them on the design to make sure that we have a building that's fit for purpose, future proof, is fully accessible and meets the needs of all of our users. We've also been working very closely with Vale of York School as our nearest neighbours. The team at Vale of York have been incredibly supportive of Explore from the beginning, and we're delighted to be working with a, such a strong educational partner who clearly supports libraries. Unfortunately, unfortunately, representatives from the Academy are unable to come tonight, but I know they're looking forward to continuing to work more, clo more closely with us. As you've heard from the other speakers, over the past 18 months, we've led a number of engagement sessions with local residents. And right from the start, the views of our library customers and residents have been important to us and we have listened. Our first consultation on the overall potential of the site identified a lack of support in relocating the play park that's next to the current library in Clifton. So this was removed from the plans. And following a survey in August 21, 90% of people who took part said that they supported the development in order to create a new um, Explore Centre for the community of Clifton. Again, as you've heard, as you've heard from the speakers. Since then, we've met with, listened to, and collaborated with a good number of people who live in Clifton and Rockcliffe. People of all ages have fed into and inspired the plans that you see in front of you. It's people and residents living in the local community who have asked for a range of green outside spaces to be included. It's and it's seconds. also members of the community who've told us they wanted us to consider environmental options in the design. And if this application is agreed tonight, we'll continue working with the community because we believe that our services work best when designed with people at their hearts. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just ask if the committee have any questions, Councillor Crawford. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks for coming to speeches this evening. Um, I think um, I don't imagine there's anybody who doesn't support the principle of, of uh, having a new uh, facility. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wanting to sort of understand a bit about how the site will work as it as it's currently laid out. Um, and I was just sort of totting up that you've got 21 car parking spaces plus for 
disabled spaces, which seemed an awful lot of car parking on the site. Um, and I just wondered if you could sort of tell us why there's so much car parking and what your travel plans are in terms of, you know, hoping to, well, hopefully give people as many different options to not use the car, you know, if they possibly could. Um, I'll let you do that one first and then I've got another question as well, if that's all right. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, we, we have got a travel plan um, and there are um, cycle um, parking spaces that's included in the design. The number of car parking spaces is purely because we are expecting, we've, well, we've obviously got a number of community partners who are um, working with us from the, from the site. Um, and some of those will need help and support in actually getting to the site and, and using the facility. Um, it's also, there will also be an element of city centre, of city wide provision. So as well as being there, the, the Explore Centre being there to support the community of Clifton, because of the um, provision that we've got on there from York Learning, from Snappy, from Accessible Arts, we are expecting users of the site to come from across um, the whole of the city, not necessarily just from Clifton, hence the increase in, in parking spaces that's required. Um, and if I may, um, the, the second question is just to do with the um, car park that's the sort of the, the well, the orangey red colour one um, there, which has identified as a, as a potential access through into the housing site as well. And I, I assume that the current boundary would be a sort of a non-permeable, i.e., you know, as you close up at night, you'd lock up and you'd have a boundary that would be sort of secure all around. Yeah. But I couldn't see how the boundary would be secure if that was then an access point through to the housing. And I don't know whether you've been part of any conversation about how that might work in practice. Just um, because if that hmm. couldn't be made secure, I would imagine that you would be likely to favour a different access point, you know, just from a site security point of view. The the site is secure beyond, I think you can see kind of a, where the white, so the area that's from the grassed area into the kind of library area that's where the site is secure so the car parking area you're right isn't isn't secure and locked off of an evening it's all of the library space beyond that that right. will be okay so so it isn't already and it wouldn't be intended to be irrespective of whether that was an access yeah point. yeah no that's great thank you okay any further questions can't see any so thank you for your time this evening thank you thank chair you. Uh, next, then, if we could have Tom uh, Stoneham uh, is speaking as the honorary treasurer of the Snappy Trust. Thank you. Could we have the ground floor of the new build on the screen, please? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and if you'd like to make a start. Thank you. Um, I am the honorary treasurer of Snappy Trust and have been for some years now. And I could talk for hours about Snappy, but uh, I'm not going to be allowed to. Um, Snappy Trust has been long established in York for more than 30 years, providing uh, play provision, active after school activities and holiday activities for young people with special educational needs, increasingly complex needs, providing respite for their families. If you haven't visited Snappy, please do. Councillors are always welcome to visit. It is a chaotic, noisy, happy place. Uh, Snappy has, for most of the last decade, been housed in Lowther Street at door 84, where we've had a re quite a restricted license, which has limited our ability to meet the increasing demand for the services we provide. Currently, we're in the Children's Centre at Hobmore Oaks, a move that was aided by Andy Laslett and his team. This is a much better quality built space for us and is allowing us to extend to after school provision. However, the building is designed for a younger age group than many of our, the young people we look after, and it's a essentially temporary move. Over the last 10 months, the process of working with Andy Laslett, Sarah Garbach, and Alan Thomas has been really positive for us. The conversations about Clift and Explore have engaged us at every stage uh, and we have seen many changes to the design in order to meet the needs of our uh, client group who have as you might imagine uh, some very special features as young people the uh, reason i asked for the plan up is the area that snappy will be licensing is in yellow there 
Uh, we do have permanent staff who will need office space, and part of the arrangement gives us flexible licensing of that. And this will allow us to extend our provision. At the moment, for example, our Saturday provision has had to be split in two so that we can provide half a day for more children. This is obviously uh, less good than we were a few years ago when we could provide whole day uh, care for them. It also impacts very much on the families. A whole Saturday when the parents and the other uh, siblings were able to uh, engage in activities which might be difficult when with the uh, children with complex needs. 30 seconds. Um, is a really important part of respite and a really important part of the ability of those families to cope. So I just want to end by saying this has been a really positive process. I thank the council for engaging with us in the design and in the future of SNAPI. And this move will help us move into the next decade of success. Thank you. And I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. I can't see any. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lastly, then, we've got um, Mark Wilson and Andy Laslett uh, and Alan Thomas, um, who I don't think are um, giving a three minute speech, but are here in case there are any questions. I don't know if you want to join us at the at the table. Um, and perhaps if you could just introduce who you are to start with, and then I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Yeah, hi, I'm Andy Laslett. I'm programme manager uh, behind this project. I am Matt Wilson, I'm project manager, also working on this project. My name is Alan Thomas from Property Services, project architect on, on Drift and Explore. Okay, and I'll just ask if there are any any questions from the committee. Um, Councillor Dugan. Um, yeah, you've you've heard um, representations being made about concern, particularly seem to be centred around the hedge, and in particular looking at this plan as reference to uh, potential access to a housing site, and a suggestion has been made that. Um, an alternative might be uh, to protect the hedge would be to effectively delete that element. Is that something that could be uh, considered? Um, is it something that we might defer to the detailed application rather than it being approved at this point? So I don't know if you want to able to comment on that. Yeah, I think in terms of our application, the housing site is outlined council aren't looking to design that right. space for a housing site it'll be a third party so in terms of what we've tried to show is how the library site connects to the housing site and the, the different arrangements of access that a detail planning application might come up with just to be transparent at this point um, in fact the access from the library car park was actually from residents themselves we didn't come up with that access option so we did include that on after the feedback from the residents that gave us that. Um, there is a commitment um, that was made at the executive around the hedge, and we uh, it was our objective to re retain the majority of that hedge. That was the wording that was in the minutes from the executive. Um, so we've always supported as much as we can the retain of that hedge, but it will not be the council who designed that area. Thank okay. you. Okay, Councillor Crosshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm just going to note we've had several speakers make reference to the decisions that were taken at executive in relation to this application. Um, I just wondered, it appears that pretty much everything within the housing site is being put into the reserve matters application. There's, there's no real restrictions at all on it. Um, and actually what we usually get on an outline application is something about, you know, maximum heights or a little bit more detail on um, sort of access points. Um, but also I was thinking things like use class, because um, a number of speakers have talked about um, an aspiration for this to be something more than just sort of standard residential dwelling, but actually, um, you know, something perhaps supported living or, or other sorts of things. I wondered um, if you could give us any sort of indication of what conversations have been had at this stage, um, and also whether um, 
I mean, it might be a question I'll end up putting to, to Gareth about what we can and can't do in terms of um, those sort of stipulations. But from your perspective, whether or not that would create any problems if there were, um, you know, either narratives or, or steer on the type of development that we might like to see. I mean, one of the planning officers might want to um, add to this, but from a project point of view, we're trying to build a fantastic new community library for our residents. The way we enable this development is to bring in some income from that housing site. Um, so from a project point of view, we were really clear in terms of the funding for this library would be some housing on that site. We've said social housing, uh, but not uh, a particular um, certain mix yet. And that's being discussed internally with our housing colleagues of how to take this to the market. And, and we'll get more clarity over the coming months on that. But at this moment, no. So if I may then, just to be clear, your expectation is to be able to facilitate the explore side of this development, you need a capital receipt from the housing side of it. It wouldn't be something that we would retain as, say, council housing and then take an income from that, that perspective. Yeah, no, that's correct. Yep. Okay, any further questions? Can't see any, so... Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, so that brings us then to the end of our public speakers. Um, so now move on to any questions to the planning officers from the committee. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. So um, sort of the same point I've just, just put to um, uh, the officers there. I, I just wondered, um, I think we've been here before with outline applications and everything being left to reserve matters and then getting to the reserve matters application and finding that things um you know should have been determined at outline or, or now can't be discussed because we didn't stipulate it at that point and i'm just wondering um how much flexibility we have at this stage to be able to insert anything around say for example um, the types of use class that we might want to see in terms of the um, residential, because I, I think at the moment, as it's worded, it's completely open, um, and whether or not there's any other stipulations that we could add in around, um, you know, potential maximum heights or maximum density or, um, you know, anything else around the way in which this site is, is used, because um, it feels to me as though what's happened at the moment is an application has been brought forward with very deliberately no stipulation whatsoever on anything other than that there'll be some housing here um and I, i'm i wonder whether the committee may want to think about whether there's things that we might want to just tighten up and it's just understanding how much flexibility there is or isn't so that the housing application is entirely in an outline everything is reserved um for consideration at reserve master stage um that doesn't preclude uh, the, the planning authority, uh, if it sees fit, um, to seeking con to control uh, the shape of that scheme at um, at reserve matter stage. But that would have to be done now. So if you, um, whilst whilst the reserve matters deals with layout scale and if we are unhappy as local planning authority with the layout, the scale, the appearance, then it's within the authority's hands to uh, to refuse that. Um, if you feel there are stipulations that should be set out in principle and outline stage, then then you can do that through condition. We didn't seek any uh, we didn't seek any further uh, information uh, at this stage from the authority uh, from the applicant on that on those matters uh in terms of use class they've applied for a housing scheme i don't think you have any powers to say it it, it um it could be a different you can specify a, a a care home type use for example you have to and i'm not sure where you would pull a requirement for elderly persons housing for example, because as far as I'm aware, there's no specification, there's no policy requirements. We would generally leave that, that to the applicants. Thank you. Because um, I also wasn't clear on exactly what was being 
proposed in terms of these outline proposals because reading it it reads more like an application for change of use rather than an application for outline planning permission and usually you'd have much more detail than this in an outline planning consent so I'm yeah I'm not completely clear on what is being proposed you know what is being recommended for approval and, um, on the housing aspect for example section 106 usually has to be done at outline stage that sort of thing doesn't it I would have expected to have more detail of, um, yeah, the number of dwellings, the scale of them, heights, distance, the boundaries, that sort of thing at, out, at an outline stage. Otherwise, it's difficult to know whether to approve the principle of development and principle of the access and whether or not it's acceptable development. Well, the, um, the, the law allows them to submit a, an outline application with all matters to be um, uh, to be reserved for later consideration. We've not done anything wrong. Um, we, you know, uh, we do. People do generally put in a bit more detail, but um, there's no reason here why why we felt that was necessary for them to submit additional detail. Can you have such one of six agreements on reserve matters application? No. The um, the area because the area is less than 0.5 of a hectare, it falls below that major threshold that we normally would. We don't know how many what the number of dwellings that's, would that's, be. That's uh, that is a fair point. We don't know that level. So if it was over the, the threshold for number of dwellings, it, it could still potentially have section one six over eleven size. over eleven for affordable housing, over ten for education and um, uh, open space. Yes. That's right. Okay. Anything? Although, so the, because the applicant is the because the landowner and the applicant is the city council, we wouldn't have a section one of six agreements. It would have to be a normally done by um, condition or an exchange of letters from the relevant director. Can't um, kind of a binding agreement with ourselves. That's what you um, I have a few uh, questions to ask. Um, firstly. The plan that you've got up there, which we've discussed about access, um, given the reservations about impact on uh, the hedge um, at this stage at outline, can we amend this to remove that uh, element that says potential access to housing this time from what we're actually proving? That would be the first question. What the um and any any references in the part in the actual um report that that suggests um that that might be um identified as as a access given what we said about the potential you alternatives that would um uh, objectors have said would be preferable um whereby the, the existing access which is on that plan could act as as access Effectively, it would leave it open to, to the reserve matters by removing that reference on the outline, is what I'm suggesting. So the, the potential access to the housing site area, um, is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is a, it's a, re it's a requirement of the, um, one of the regulation orders, I don't forget which now, uh, that with an outline application, even if uh, access is um, reserved, mm -hmm. to give some indication. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. They've given an indication here. Okay, so, and they've given an indication here of where access can be taken. Uh, if members felt there was sufficient justification to uh, put a condition on saying that uh, mm -hmm. you shouldn't have uh or there couldn't be an access from any particular position then um yeah. it would be within your I'd, uh remit to do that i'd refer to paragraph 5.8 the last sentence in that paragraph suggests it's recommended any permission be conditioned to secure vehicle access routes and service runs away from the line of the hedge which presumably means avoiding going through the hedge by my reading, but so 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 if the office has identified that as a 
as, a, as a, an issue. And I think there's a reference to it in the following paragraph as well. And you've heard the uh, views of objectors to suggest that that would be a preferable option. So all I'm saying is that if you remove reference to that being the potential access, if you need to, you can say where, where it says existing access, that could be existing and, and potential access. That wouldn't preclude it being potential access from elsewhere, but it wouldn't indicate in the outline that that's what was expected. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the, the, there won't be a reuse of the existing access on that corner. That's specifically in condition 23 going to be uh, stocked up because that's the location of the, of the cross. And that's, that's not acceptable to have a, um, it might actually be better to show on there. Well, isn't, isn't that, it's sorry, here. can you just clarify, isn't that what the uh, proposers were suggesting somewhere? A shared access for the the library and the, the housing. That's I don't. It doesn't matter where it is, but that was the proposal. But that's um, that's this one, is it not? Yeah. So that's that this right? one here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so okay. that shows the potential access. Through. Sorry, that sorry, that's what I meant. So that yeah. one. Yeah. If, if 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 members feel that that is the only access that is appropriate um to this uh, for this application then uh i would suggest that you would need to uh, put a condition on the outline application to say that to restrict any i don't know if you want to restrict any access or any vehicular access mm -hmm. or vehicular pedestrian access. cycle access uh, from fairway access. you would have to put a condition i would say mm. and the that. vehicle access is the key one because obviously it takes more the hedge to provide sight lines and and so forth doesn't it drainage and curbs okay any further questions councillor crawshaw yeah just returning to councillor melly's point about the um 106 um and i'm just wondering because again i'm, I'm, I'm just concerned that we have a very open outline here that we then in a year or two's time are told that we can't you know hmm. not do this or not do that or should have asked for this should have asked for that and in particular the points around um things like affordable housing provision and, and that sort of thing i'm just wondering if there's a way of conditioning either to stipulate that there should be an amount of affordable housing commensurate with the current policies you know so that it's clear that the in, intention is for there to be a delivery of at least 20 percent um and or whether the other way of conditioning would be to actually just specify it now um i don't i don't know whether or not that's something I, i'm just a bit concerned with all of this that i can see why you want to keep it oh, sorry i don't mean you but you know i can see why one might want to keep it open if we're not quite clear exactly what's going to go on the site but the other side of it is that if we get to a point further down the line when we're suddenly told well we can't have this and we can't have that we'll all be kicking ourselves yeah the um the way the way to secure it would be uh let's say because it's a uh, local authority land uh the way to secure it would be by condition uh you can't specify numbers at this stage because you don't know what uh what um how many houses are going to come forward so if it comes forward with fewer than 11 then it would fall below the affordable housing policy as written at the moment. Um, obviously, that's a slight state of flux because um, local uh, examination is going through at the moment. Uh, so I would suggest that you would seek three additional uh, conditions, one for a scheme of the provision of educational places, one for a scheme of... Um, the provision of off-site um, open space, play facilities, et cetera, and one for a scheme of affordable housing, all referencing the current local plan um, requirements. And if those, uh, if those thresholds are exceeded, then there will be a requirement for, for us to agree um, contributions or on-site provision.
Okay, Councillor Manning. Um, the preference is always for the outdoor amenity space and affordable housing, etc., to be on site where possible. So I, I'd be worried about a condition which stipulates something like the equivalent of Section 106 to pay for that to be off site because it limits the ability to have it. Would it limit the ability to have it on site? Uh, I would. We, we should follow the policy. Uh, so if it was the if it was the level of policy, if it was a level of provision where the requirement would be on site, then that would be the expectation. But if it was below that, then we should follow the, 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 the we, we try and be policy led. So um, just because it's a local authority site, we wouldn't um, we wouldn't seek any uh, anything different. I would say. So if it's if it's a, at a level of the contribution is normally sought, then my suggestion would be that was that would be what we should seek. Um, it's a different question rather than a supplementary. I don't know if someone else had their hand up. Okay. Um, just in terms of the options that are available to us today, in terms of, um, you know, we can either approve as recommended, refuse for different reasons, or add amended conditions. Can we approve, you know, hypothetically, if we were minded to, could we approve just the library scheme and not the out, you know, the detailed aspect of the application and not the outline? housing aspect of the application so that in future when there's more detail and perhaps a private developer we could enter into section 106 agreement and and you know decide the application on actually having the detail required to know whether it's acceptable development can i have a word with the senior solicitor mm. No, normally, no, you put the application, you, you, we determine the application in front of us. Um, it, is, it is possible um, to do a, 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 a sort of a split decision where there's two entirely sort of severable elements. But um, I think from the applicant's point of view, that I'm not sure they would consider them to be several. But they come as a they come as a package, which is why they've submitted them as um, as they have. Uh, it, it it was a point of discussion before they submitted the application whether to put in two applications or one, uh, and they've come down this way. Um, but having said that, in terms of uh, being able to, to to pull out two different parts of an application and and approve one and you you kind of you don't refuse it. I don't think we have the we don't have the powers to refuse it. We can only put a condition on saying shall not uh, shall not go ahead. I think the scale is I think the scale is such that we've 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 applied that sort of thing to domestic extensions and advertisements, not to something of this scale. I. I would, 
we can't answer definitively. Uh, my advice would be it's um, it would be uh, fraught with difficulty. Councillor Crawshaw, just thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I appreciate that, and and I appreciate the, the the fraught with difficulty element. Apart from that, the council is also the applicant on this occasion, and I think if it was a private developer and we were seeking to do something um, like that, I could see how that might open you to a set of challenges that might be difficult or more difficult to defend. Um, I'm just wondering whether actually because of the circumstances of this application, there is a little bit more scope for flexibility, because certainly from my perspective at, at this moment in time, and I appreciate we're not quite in debate yet, um, it is the lack of information about the housing site area that's causing me concern and the real concern that we may ultimately lose um, essentially affordable housing, but, you know, 106 contributions in whatever form they might be if we can't find a way of setting them at this stage and so it's that divorcing of the two elements that might perhaps enable some of those questions to be answered in a way that the committee might may then feel more comfortable about if your concern is affordable housing or other contributions then that can be covered by condition i'm confident that that's 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 that that's my advice okay um but in terms of the yeah sorry. in terms of that in terms of the the applicant being the, the uh, being cyc i mean we have to deal with it as a local planning authority and that that, that shouldn't really come into job i, I was just going to say i'd second that advice if the concern is in relation to affordable housing contributions all those things that would be in a 106 can't happen at the moment because it's CYC land. We can't enforce against ourselves. We can't enter into an agreement with ourselves as an entity. So that couldn't happen. So the natural way you would do that is through a grampian condition, not to do something until there's been a scheme agreed. Um, and that's how we would usually do it. And for that reason, you wouldn't normally put a condition on. That's why I believe in this case, it absolutely is possible because that is the way that you do it anyway. So if those, because those are the concerns it is possible and that would be the way that I would say would be Thank the you. most sensible way to approach it. Thank you. Okay, any further questions, Councillor de Gorm? It's a, a different uh, aspect of the uh, application. There's just perhaps put me right if I got this wrong, but there's a proposal is, is the detail of that access <laughs> to the school and we um condition the report suggests that that would only be used during school times can we actually condition that its its use would be subject to being locked up um before you know up till say eight o'clock and after six at night or something you know whatever is appropriate for its its uh, intended use is that something we could add in as a as a condition given we're asked to be identify that particular corridor um yes if that's something that you you consider is necessary and meets the tests of, of conditions then then that would be no. reasonable i think particularly given the residential amenity of adjacent property that would be a reasonable uh condition to put on thank you that's a crucial thanks just on that as well actually i i may have missed it in the report but what what will the status of that access point be? Will it be adopted highway? Will it be retained as part of Explores land and therefore they'll be in control of it? Will it be the schools? Uh, it would be uh, for the school, for the Bale of York Academy. So we would transfer that, like that land to the because the, the well, Bell of York Academy is a is yeah, a, maybe that I, um, yeah that's, that's is, not our that's not our role to, to determine that I can't answer but uh, I imagine that's the that's what would happen. Okay, no, it's just it, it may change how we choose to deal with it depending on who's because if it's adopted highway and it's council land, that's no, it wouldn't that's be adopted highway. It's, wouldn't yeah. be adopted highway. Councillor Melly, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry to ask the same question that was already asked earlier. Um, 
there was a question about the trees and which ones are being retained. Because did you say earlier that some of the ones on Rawcliffe Drive weren't to be retained? The cherry yes. tree. Okay. I'm just I'm just looking at the plan on page 88 and next to Rawcliffe Drive it says all existing trees retained. So that's just confused me a bit about which trees are conditioned to be kept and which ones will be lost as part of the development. They, they are the grade C trees. So they could be they, they are the grade C trees. The, the condition covers grades A and B. They are the grade C, C trees. Just to clarify, there are two small self-seeded trees in the hedge, which are also grade C, but the, the, the condition that we have put, the, the suggested condition put forward, seeks to retain all the grade A and B trees. So where it says all trees retained, all existing trees retained, it just means all existing grade A and B trees. Yes, retained. yes. If it says elsewhere that they are to be retained, then they, then they will be retained, but we're not conditioning that they be retained. We're conditioning that the grade A and B trees, which are the ones graded higher in terms of their significance, would be retained. So on the plans where it shows trees to be retained, they'd be retained through the condition that says development has to yes. be developed yes. subject yes. to the, yes. the plans. Yes. That'd be that condition rather yes. than the yes. tree specific condition. Yes. Right. Okay, any further questions at this point for officers? Can't see any then, so if we're happy then to move into debate, um, I'll invite any views. Um, Councillor Broshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think the principle of what goes on on the Explore side of this application, I really have no issue with whatsoever. Um, I, I did just have a slight nagging sort of worry that four um, disabled parking bays may not be enough depending on who's using the site, but I think that that's something that the Explore site themselves would also be able to manage. So that that part of it, I think, is fine. Um, I am concerned about how little information we have in the housing site area and how we've been stung before <laughs> when we haven't stipulated things at this point. But I am also slightly worried about... Um, sort of unforeseen con consequences as well. Um, so for example, if we were to try and remove the access for vehicles from fairway as a potential access point without knowing anything about the type of dwellings that might be put on the site in the future and how that might be laid out, my worry would be that it potentially could lead to um, a much more limited developed site it could potentially lead to more of the green space that's on the site being lost than would be necessary under different circumstances so my sense is that we need to make sure we go down the route of the grampian conditions as, as has been suggested um on particularly on the 106 uh, you know with all the things that that might cover um, and then just satisfy ourselves that with the additional conditions that we've had put before us today and the existing conditions around the retention of the green space on the site, that we're satisfied that that's enough protection for what's there already. And I don't know whether or not we can do anything around an informative around um, a preference for the type of housing that we'd like to see on the site. I think it is from what you've said, Gareth, difficult for us to say it has to be um, sheltered accommodation or it has to be, um, you know, entirely um, social housing or, or, you know, whatever. But I think certainly from my perspective, if I was looking at this uh, and it had a little bit more detail, they're the sorts of things that I'd be looking at and going, yes, I'd have no hesitation in going ahead with it if it was for an affordable, uh, entirely affordable housing development or uh, entirely social housing or an entirely... Um, older people's accommodation my worry is just that if we need to generate income from this site and we leave it too open and we're not sufficiently robust around the 106 uh, agreements what we end up with is a site that a developer will be well within their rights to maximize um, and that may not ultimately be what uh, everybody wants to see happen on the site Any further comments? 
Councillor Oral. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thought the comments from the speakers about access were very interesting and helpful. And Councillor de Gorn then followed that up by suggesting that the access from Fairway be taken out of the, the application. I think that's correct, uh, Councillor de Gorn. Yeah, so, uh, just, just to clarify, it does say in the report that all matters, including access, is reserved. Yeah. So, you know, which obviously I wasn't sort of aware of from that drawing on the plan and the rest of the comments that were made. So if if they are reserved, then I don't have such a concern, but we just need to be clear. That that okay, if case. we could if we could stick to individual. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Go back to Councillor Oral and then I know. Yeah. So I would support what Councillor Gorn was saying, despite what, what he said about what's in the report. That seems uh, a sensible way forward uh, in terms of the, the hedge uh, on fairway, which seems to be a, a major uh, concern within this application. Uh, so that, those are my thoughts at the moment, Chair. Okay, Councillor Melly. Um, I just wanted to note that um, the outline planning consent for the York Central Development said the absolute first reserved matter was access. It said that all matters to do with access were reserved for every single reserved matters application. And yet when a reserved matters application came to committee, committee were told they couldn't discuss access whatsoever. So having just having something saying, you know, all matters to do with access are reserved doesn't reassure me. Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think I have any reservations whatsoever about the explore site i think the scheme looks extremely good and i think that is not a problem i had severe reservations about the um the re removal of any part of the hedge or any significant part of the hedge um i certainly would oppose an access off um fairway if it came to reserve matters application including the access i would not be happy with that i think the hedge is sacrosanct i'm delighted to see that the trees are protected the principal trees on the site are protected I think it's critically important that we get back to the basics of this application, which is an outline application. It is establishing the principle of the development of this site. And clearly this is a brownfield site. It's a disused brownfield site in, and in the NPPF, there is a presumption in favor of developing this. So I think outline planning permission should be granted. It's only a question of getting the conditions right. Now, in my view, there is a certain element um, of uncertainty about what the site is to be used for. We've got plenty of indicators here. It's a notionable quantum of about 25 dwellings over 0.7 of hectare. And it says that the, the, the a lease will be sought for affordable housing provision. So I think the, the obvious intention is to do the right thing, but perhaps we should put the Grampian condition on. And that could be delegated to officers, I presume, to negotiate that, to cover our backs, to ensure that, you know, for play provision, out, open space provision, and if it turns out that affordable housing is not to be proposed, then an affordable housing contribution could be negotiated. Um, and with if that can be done, I'm prepared to move this application. Okay, I'll go to Councillor Dordney and then Councillor Crawshaw. Um, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just would remind us all that we, as in City of York Council, may not be the applicant that brings the reserve matters application and so the well-intentioned thoughts about what might go on the site would be completely potentially lost unless we're really robust in what we're um, saying on it um but I, I i'm really concerned about the law of unintended consequences of seeking to remove the access from fairway altogether um i am absolutely with I think everybody around the table by the sounds of it in terms of wanting to ensure that the hedge is retained as far as is possible and i think that what we also need to not lose sight of is there's quite a lot of other green space and um rich habitat on the other side of that hedge we heard one of the speakers talking about all that land in the right hand side that's currently a wildlife garden uh, you know as was um, and, you know, we saw from the um, aerial photograph on the, on the street view um, that, you know, it's not just those four trees that we see there. It's a, a whole area of habitat there. Now, my worry is that with the access from Rawcliffe Lane being removed entirely, which is what is proposed, the only access point that you then are left with is to come in from Rawcliffe Drive 
through the explore car park and then onto the site now if that's what happens you potentially limit the amount of dwellings that can go in that left hand side of the site because of the need to access the site and you therefore push more dwellings and potentially roadway down towards the trees and the habitat which is predominantly more at the right hand side of the site it might be useful to go back to the um, um street view image if you if you can the aerial image that just shows where the current green space and the current tarmac space is so if you look at that big long wedge of green my worry is that if you restrict at this point without knowing what the plan for the dwellings is you may end up causing more damage to the ecology of the site unintentionally than leaving a little bit more leeway in terms of it now I don't want to see any of the hedge removed that would be my first preference but actually as the condition is set out here in uh, condition 32 it does make clear that it's to minimize it to to absolutely only remove it if necessary and so I would just be a bit cautious about committee deciding at this point to remove an access point from fairway when we may unintentionally create more of a problem down the line Councillor Fisher. The condition that is proposed, condition 32, is fairly clear that they can apply for an app, uh, further. It says basically, no part of the head shall be removed unless permission is granted either by details approval of this condition or pursuant to the reserve matters. So consequently, they could apply for it if they found the site was otherwise undevelopable or there was not economic to develop. Um, and then it will be up to whoever sits on this committee, because I suspect this won't come forward in the terms of this particular council, it may be the next planning being committee, who have to decide it, and some of them may not be here. But I think we have to allow for the fact that they have the right to apply for a further access off fairway if they want. It's then up to this committee to decide whether that is approved or not, taking into account the whole overview of what is put forward at Reserve Matters. Mm -hmm. Which I think is what I'm saying, but not what I'm hearing from those of you who are talking about removing access from fairway. Sorry, let's try and keep it through the chair one at a time. Councillor de Gorn, were you going to? Just to clarify, what I was saying is, was the indicative plan and, and take on board Councillor Melly's point that, you know, at some point in the future, um, if you approve that plan with a, a drawing that says potential access, that indicates quite clearly that's what you're you're thinking, rather than what we've been discussing of looking seriously at alternatives that protect the hedge. So if you want to have some alternative wording that says a preference for a combined access for the library and the housing um, in order to protect the hedge, um, and in in order to minimise re any removal of the hedge, I'd be happy with that as a con as a condition. Okay, are there any further comments? Try and unpick this, Councillor Melly. Um, I was just going to say I agree with Councillor Gorn. Again, this is a direct parallel to the outline planning from Saint for York Central. A parameter plan said the pedestrian access down Lehman Road would be potentially through a building. And then when it came to reserve matters, we were told nothing you can do, they can put a building there. So I, I, I think for me personally, that seems like the best combination, the proposed condition and also removing from the parameter plan the, the principle of putting access through the hedge. So that, that principle can then be determined at a later stage rather than being determined now at this stage when we haven't seen the details for the rest of the site. So I could ask Gareth, what would be the what impact would removing that potential access from the plan have in terms of? Uh, you would, uh, you, you, you put it in proposed condition, I think, um, not very condition 32, I would suggest uh, you take away that, sorry, I'm thinking, I'm thinking as I go in. Uh, you so you you 
probably take away that last uh, that that second paragraph in condition thirty two, and then you put a, a separate condition on saying there should be no access from the fairway. If I was following, Chair, could Gareth repeat the last bit that he just said? You put a condition on saying no access from fairway. So with that, and then you can specify whether that's a vehicular access, a pedestrian access, or any other type of access. But if you if you remove from the plan the proposed access point, would that that would then presumably prevent any deemed consent for that you wouldn't necessarily then need to say no access from fairway because that would then have to come through the planning through the reserve matters side of things because yeah we don't necessarily want to stop access from fairway you just don't want to give it deemed approval at this stage is what i'm hearing <laughs> I don't think you can have it both ways. I think you have to make a, um, you know, if there's no condition, then potentially they can come back and um, and have. Uh, I think it's one of the speakers suggested a line of uh, a line of um, a line of semis or a terrace, for each with an individual vehicle access, and we would have to determine that at reserve matter stage, and our position may be. Uh, weaker because we didn't specify that uh, there was a uh, uh, that couldn't come forward. Uh, so, sorry, can I help? Can, can 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 we can say that it should be shared access uh, for the library and the housing as as what we approve? Obviously, if the subsequently a developer doesn't like that and wants to change that then they can come back with a either a, a to detail matters or to vary the outline approval if they, if they want to vary that then and then the committee at that point in time will then make a judgment call on the basis of representations and whatever you know the the issue was around the site but at the moment reflecting the views of local residents and objectors the preference seemed to be and and officers have acknowledged that there is some merit in saying uh, a combined access uh, vehicular access for the housing site and the library site should be provided that doesn't then say anything about uh, pedestrian access that could be completely a separate question it's a vehicular access that's the issue because that's what obviously drives yeah. Um, a lot of concerns, not just about loss of the hedge, but also the uh, increased traffic and so on. Well, there's a so it, it, it's shown uh, as a there's shown as a potential access to housing uh, right. through through the car park. Right. So that's one so, of so their, just leave that and so remove the other arrow. One of their proposals. Highways is highways are happy uh, with that as a principle. Okay. It will affect the layout of what comes forward. Um, that's clear. Uh, you're right. If you put a condition on saying no vehicular access from the fairway, it doesn't preclude them coming back and seeking to change that condition. But to impose a condition, that condition has to be reasonable. Uh, you can't impose a condition because the residents want you to. You have to be clear that um there's a there, there is, there's a sound basis for imposing that condition yeah and i think the, the residents have put forward a number of reasons in particular the green corridor the the biodiversity aspects you know those uh key issues um and protecting of the, the green environment of that whole area um you know it, it all ties in together it's not just about the vehicular access is it the justification for that condition is to, to, to maximise the efficiency of access uh, without and minimising the damage to the, the hedge and the ecology.
Chair, Highways Network are suggesting that option, aren't they? That is their suggestion. There has to be the option of, uh, of, of an access, uh, satisfied that an access through the car park would be workable. Okay. Is it on? Okay. That's a crucial. Thanks, Chair. I'm just wondering if um, there's a way of conditioning something along the lines of um, the access from, you know, a single access from fairway should only be sought if, you know, access from, uh, you know, via the explore site. Um, causes too much harm to the existing ecology or uh, I'm not sure what the what the wording would be I'm just really worried that you've got a great big green area on the whole of the right hand side of the site and if you only come in through the existing car park you've got to put a car park where you would otherwise build dwellings on the left hand side and so what you might end up with is a car park where you'd ideally want to put your houses and then more damage to the green space on the right hand side of the site so I'm just wondering if there's a way of wording a condition that makes it clear that the committee is not wanting there to be a vehicle access from the fairway if that's avoidable, but that if there has to be um, a vehicle access, it's a single, you know, single access point. So that covers off your, your point about building terrace houses, but somehow encapsulates that what we're seeking to do is maximize retention of the ecological assets on the whole site. So far as I can tell, that is essentially what's in the conditions, apart from the single access point. I would agree. Um, so I think we're in danger, really, of sort of, you know, dancing on a pinhead on this one. And everybody's sort of slightly saying the same thing, but just coming at it from, from slightly different angles. I'll attempt to move us forward a little bit. So... Uh, when we come to proposing a motion, obviously our starting point is the officer's recommendation, um, which we have as before us um, with the additions in the update. I think as well, generally, there are some aspects that we've discussed so far that have seemed to me to be uncontroversial. Um, and generally, we just include those being the uh, Grampian conditions to refer to affordable housing, uh section 106 or the equivalent with the council uh and councillor de gorn's point about the gate what seems what seems to me to be more controversial is how exactly we go about protecting the hedge so to my mind what is there already in condition 32 does what everybody wants that condition to do which is to seek to avoid any unnecessarily any unnecessary uh, any unnecessary removal of the hedge and that that seems to me to be fairly clear and is leaving a decision on exactly how that is judged to a future committee uh, at a reserved matter stage so in an effort then to move us forward i will move the officer's recommendations plus the um, the Grampian conditions, and I'll ask Gareth the best way of dealing with that. Councillor de Gorn's point about the gate, um, and I'll ask if anybody is willing to second that when Gareth has perhaps suggested what those conditions suggested earlier would be exactly. I'm well, I'm happy with access point slash points. <laughs> I think that's for a later point to determine it, depending on what comes forward. Um, well, perhaps if you could explain again about how we might word the condition to cover the point about the section 106 affordable yeah. housing uh, open space provision.
No, no, I was sort of suggest. So um, we wouldn't want to wouldn't want to attempt to draw it up in front of you. Uh, but generally, your uh, a housing scheme that that goes beyond the threshold set out in the local plan. Um, you would be seeking. Uh, it would be seeking in a, a so you'd have a condition which set out what those thresholds were and then sought the submission of a a scheme of either on site provision or i think given the size of the site more likely to be um uh to be off site contributions but um we'd write a condition that didn't preclude it either way and that would cover affordable housing uh, education and um, amenity open space, active sport and leisure, and play facilities. They're generally the three housing um, housing led section one hundred six um, obligations. Uh, and then that scheme would set out the mechanism for uh, for securing them. Okay, so I'm going to ask then if anybody's willing to second that. Councillor Fisher? I, think I did actually propose that for approval earlier on, but I will now second for approval since I think the conditions have changed rather. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just clarify your suggesting that this includes paragraph 32, are you, in terms of condition 32? And just my wanting to clarify my understanding of what that means, it says to secure retention of a hedge found in the site uh, shall be uh, prior to commencement development, detailed management plan, secure retention of a hedge. It doesn't say how much of it um, shall include measures to secure the hedge, including appropriate fencing, et cetera, et cetera. No part then shall be removed unless permission is granted. So it's not saying that the whole of the hedge will be retained, is it? No, but I'm, my own view is that that is not necessary, but it is for a future committee to determine that. And I'm happy for that, that that leaves that decision open for a future committee, uh, depending when they've seen the, the full sort of scheme, whether it's, it's necessary in the context of that. Councillor Melly? Um, I personally would like to say thank you to, to officers for coming up with this new condition at the last minute. I know that was quite a lot of work in the last few days. Um, but I disagree with what's just been said about this new condition protecting the hedge if it's possible for access to be made through the you know through the shared access. I I think that if you approve these plans that say access through the hedge, and that, and it has a condition saying no part of the hedge will be removed unless permission is granted, when yeah. the application then comes in for permission to go through the hedge. Mm. Will be um, the the committee or officers or have the decisions will be, will be made will be told well you can't refuse it you have to approve it because in outline it's already been approved the principle of access through the hedge so I don't think it does what I th I think what we've agreed as a committee is that we'd like to avoid access through that hedge if possible but still leave the option open in case it is considered accessible acceptable in the future I think this doesn't leave the decision to be made in the future whether it's acceptable to have access through the hedge i think that would still be agreed in principle from the plan having an arrow on it saying access yeah because there was there was a suggestion that we kind of reserve the position on uh an access from fairway um pursuant to uh, following but looking into whether it's feasible to have the whole access from um, uh, from Rawcliffe Drive. Um, if, if that was the condition that you wanted, I think I'm going to have to go away and think about it uh, because uh, I'm not quite sure how it would how it would work. How you would use a condition to, you know, eliminate one option and then allow um, Allow a second option to be to be looked at and brought th forward through the reserve matters. Um, I'm not saying we can't do it, but I'd have to think about how we would word it. Uh, so if, if that was the way you wanted to go, um, I, I'd suggest just, um, delegating that to officers to come back to 
chair and vice chair. I'd certainly be happy to propose um, delegating the wording of a condition that reserves the principle of access from fairway subject to exploring all options to use the Rawcliffe Drive access. But yes, somehow I, it needs to say something about... I think about, you're picking up on my yeah, problem with thinking yeah. of the mission, but yeah. yeah okay. Because we're not what we don't want to say. I would sorry, just to just to elaborate slightly. What we don't want to say is you only come through that hedge if you can't come in through Rawcliffe Drive, because we know you can come in through Rawcliffe Drive. It's just about trying to make the best use of a site, isn't it? But from an ecological point of view, not from a development point of view. Now we've got a proposal which has been seconded, which I'm happy to test the committee's opinion on. Um, if that falls, we can come back and have a separate proposal. As I say, I, I think the condition as drafted really covers all this. Um, and I think we're just coming at it from a slightly different angle. And essentially, whatever happens, whether we do that or this, we're going to end up in the same place. Um, that's my view. But I'm happy to, perhaps if Gareth, if you could give us a rundown of where we are exactly. Could we, before we take a vote, could we clarify with officers, if we agree at outline stage, the principle of access through that hedge, can we then at reserve matters stage say, no, you can't build access through that hedge? That's what it boils down to, isn't it? No, you couldn't do that. If you agree at if you agree at this, if you agree at this stage, a plan that says we well, certainly it's a difficult to because it's, a, it's an indicative plan with all matters to be um with all matters reserved, but but the uh, the, the reserve matter stage isn't as I would say isn't quite as strong as quite as strong as that in in uh, in terms of being able to ref refuse something that was that was shown on a drawing. So you would have to um, you would have to condition against it. It wouldn't, um, yeah. If I may, I think ultimately, if the potential access off the fairways is not acceptable in principle at all that needs to be conditioned i think that's where we're at <laughs> okay yeah I, sorry chair if i may i, I think the problem is i because i absolutely agree if we think it was completely unacceptable then we absolutely should just condition against it i think where the problem falls is that it might be acceptable under some circumstances but that if we give approval to the principle of access as we've seen on plenty of other outlines what will potentially happen down the line is reserve matters will come forward with a access point from fairway that doesn't take into account all of the things that we're grappling with at the moment and we'll be told that we can't refuse it because we've agreed the principle of access so that's the nub of it and that's where i think there is a need for an additional condition on top of what's already there um, just to really kind of give the future committee the opportunity to be able to say no actually this doesn't meet that test that we at the outline stage were seeking to encapsulate perhaps but the the bar isn't whether there's a potential better option it's whether if that came forward that would be acceptable and in in that scenario i can see a, an access from fairway being acceptable to me so it's it's not whether there's a better potential option. It's whether that on its own is potentially acceptable, which to my mind it is. Okay, we've got a proposal which has been seconded. I would like to try and move this forward, unless it's a burning question. question. If we put a condition that there was no access, fair, access from Fairway and the developers found the site could not be developed correctly without that access, mm -hmm. then it is within their powers to come back to us and apply mm -hmm. for a variation of that condition. Is that not correct? Yeah. Thank you. So then, 
Yeah, to so Section 73 of the Act. And we have had circumstances where we've had a reserve matters that's come in at the same time as the Section 73 to vary a condition. It's true. Okay, well, we've got a proposal which has been seconded. Gareth, could you give us a quick rundown of where we are? I'll do my best. So there's a, the, the, um, we move the, the, the officer's recommendation uh, subject to the amended conditions, including the delegated authority to officers on, on the wording of certain of those conditions on the first page of the update. Um, with additional uh, conditions, um, which again, the wording has been delegated to officers in terms of potentially securing the potential of affordable housing, education, open space payments, uh, an additional condition regarding the hours of use of the, of the gate. Uh, and then I would suggest, again, um, it, it was a delegated approval uh, two officers uh, to look at the wording of. Actually, I think I'm suggesting I'll suggest wording rewording condition 32 uh, to um, to come up with a wording which seeks to. I guess are we, are we seeking to encourage access from Rawcliffe Drive. Uh, but not precluding um, an access from fairway uh, if um, if the access from Northcliffe Drive is um, unfeasible for the whole of the site. Okay then. I would like to. Yeah, question of clarity sorry. before we vote. Okay. So, was that last bit de delegated officers as well, or was that last bit delegated to officers and for approval from chair and vice chair? Uh, chair and vice chair, yeah. But well, all of those, um, the, the grampian conditions as well. So, come back to the chair and vice chair. Okay. So, then can I see all those in favour of that as outlined by Gareth? Thank you. All those against? Okay, so that is approved. Okay. Okay, they are recorded anyway. Okay, thank you. So thank you to the public speakers as well. I know that was a, a marath session. Um, I'd like to take a 10 minute break now, if we could come back about five to, sorry, 35 minutes past six.
Okay, then if we could move back to item 4A. Um, Gareth, if you're able to. Yeah, so this is a planning application in the Central Library Gardens uh, Museum Street, uh, change of use of land to form a 12 hole mini golf course um, for a period of seven years. Um, so the presentation, and so there's a location plan. Uh, just going through the, uh, the surrounding list of buildings might be of help. So the St. Leonard's Hospital is a uh, grade one listed building. Uh, Multangular Tower is uh, grade one, as is the attached city wall. Um, and uh, the city walls in both directions are obviously grade one listed. Uh, Central Library is grade two listed. Um, the Museum Gardens is a registered park and garden, although that, that listing doesn't, um, doesn't encompass this, uh, this site. The whole site is within the Central Historic Core Conservation Area um, and in the area of archaeological importance. So uh, there are some photographs. So uh, the library and the, um, the St. Leonard's Hospital ruins. So that looks towards Museum Street. There's properties on the other side of Museum Street here. And then um, uh, standing on the, on the ruins of an altangular tower. And there's the tower itself the library to the right hand side of the shop. Oh, that's graph. And then the uh, uh, the plan showing the, the layout of the course. And uh, proposed planting plan. Um, there is a very short update. So, uh, so if we can do that. Uh, we've had one further objection from the York Civic Trust since the report was published. Uh, they've stated that the revisions to the drawings do not mitigate their concerns regarding the suitability of the proposal for this highly sensitive historic location, and they therefore maintain their objection. Okay, thank you. I'll just ask if there's any questions on the presentation at this point, Councillor Milley. Thank you, Chair. And um, in the photos, I couldn't see this Roman oven remains. Would you mind pointing out where they are and what their significance is and what protection they require? Yeah. So we can see the coffin uh, lids just in front of it in the ground. There's um, a kind of shape which is the Roman oven it's on a circular um that's I believe um been moved from somewhere else on the site but it's a Roman oven okay any further questions no? I think we can move on then to our public speakers uh the first of which is Barry Ferguson um, well, you've got the note there about his objection. Um, we'll move on then to Alison Camis. Thank you. Um, and as you'll have heard earlier, you've got three minutes to address the committee, and I'll try and give you a warning about 30 seconds to go. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. So my name's Alison Camis and I manage the volunteer service for children and young people and families within City of York Council. I'm here in a personal capacity, but as I go on, you'll see how that fits in with the role that I do within the council. I supervise David Pinch in his role as a volunteer independent visitor. Briefly, independent visitors are a statutory offer to young people in care to offer a stable, supportive and long-term relationship with an independent adult. Outside the, many, outside the many professionals the young person will be working with. All IVs are volunteers who receive no reward for their time and commitment. Our, v, our, our Vs 
commit to support their matched young person over many years with monthly activities to form a trusted positive relationship and provide independent support. Independent visitors are increasingly finding it difficult to find fun and engaging activities in York that fit in with the lim limited monthly budget. David is York's longest serving independent visitor, having volunteered in the role for over 12 years. He spoke to us some time ago about his vision for this mini golf proposal and how he wants the venture to add true value for the disadvantaged children of York. As such, he has ensured that accessibility is designed in the plans from the start. He has also committed to allow fostered young children and children and young people, disabled and special needs children and their carers, the ability of, to play free of charge, as well as committing to support the Snappy Trust in many other ways. I know David is sincere in making these offers as he has first-hand experience of the challenge of stretching an ever-decreasing budget to provide young people with the best opportunities and experience. I feel this activity would be absolutely invaluable in offering young people a fun and experience time with their trusted adults. We all know only too well how easily vulnerable young people can disengage with education and be unaware of the history of the beautiful city they live in. But the mini golf would help them understand, appreciate and respect what is on their doorstep without them even realising they were having a history lesson. We currently have over 50 young people in care matched with an independent visitor who all have the challenge of finding meaningful and positive activities on this budget. I truly believe providing them with free entry into this activity would benefit so many vulnerable young people. It's a completely unique opportunity which shows the generosity and genuine desire of David Finch to support and enrich the most disadvantaged and vulnerable children and young people in the city. Therefore, I support his application wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just ask if the committee have any questions for you. I can't see any, so I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker then is Susan Brook, who's speaking for Explore, you, uh, Explore York. Thank you. And if you want to make a start in your own time. All right. Thank you, Chair. I'm Susan Brooke. I'm Chief Finance Officer of Explore York Libraries and Archives. And I'd like to explain why we're supporting the planning application for the mini golf to be on library lawn next to York Explore. We as Explore have ambitious long term plans separate to the mini golf to develop the whole of St. Leonard's Hospital area upon which the library stands and which includes the library lawn. These plans will include enabling communities to explore, learn and understand more about the heritage of this significant but lesser well known about area of the city, as well as providing a stepping stone into the nationally significant archive collection, which is also held at York Explore. Once evolved, which will work with key stakeholders to develop, these plans are going to take a significant amount of funding and many years to bring to fruition. York Explore is a popular, thriving, well-loved library and archive service. We offer access to cultural and creative opportunities, as well as providing a safe, welcoming, accessible space that bring people together. The sensitively designed mini golf course, which is fully exclusive and accessible, and with a focus on family, contributes to the wider objective of York Explore, being a space that's welcome to all and brings communities together. The design of the mini golf course includes snippets of information on the heritage of the site and also of key historic elements of the city, so creating a learning experience as well as a fun one. People making use of the course who then want to find out a bit more can nip into the archive to research a bit deeper. Anyone using the course can of course make use of our amazing library and reading cafe facilities and we do hope that this will increase awareness of our facilities to customers who do not don't currently use the library. In addition, while we work up our long-term plans, we want to make use of this valuable asset to generate some additional income to help us to be more financially sustainable, especially in current difficult times, and to enable us to invest in doing more of the activities that we know our customers love through surveys and feedback that we receive from them. The mini golf proposal would offer a dependable income stream without the burden on current library resources and the lease agreement we've negotiated will secure the return of the site to its present state at the end of the lease term. We believe that the mini golf proposal aligns with many of Explore's aims, such as to promote learning, 
attract new library users and increase sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. I was just asking if the committee have any questions. Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. Um, you said that the lease agreement includes returning the land to the current state after it expired. Does, um, does that include things like um, repaving the path or would that be a long term improvement for the library beyond um, the, this proposed? Use? The intention is that the um, path is put to a disability compliant, um, which will stay and remain. What it will put back is where the course is outlined that will be put back to turf as it is currently. OK, any further questions, Councillor Jabal? Yes, just if you could help us a little bit with the, the how significant the the income element of it is. I appreciate there's also a benefit in terms of attracting people, but is, is the income important from that? The income is very important to us um, and it gives us stability. But what it also gives us is the ability to uh, increase our footfall both into the cafe and into other activities and, and things we do. Mm -hmm. um, but the rent is a good level too that would allow us to pay for additional staff and resources. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw and then Councillor Manning. Thanks, Chair, and uh, hi, thanks for coming this evening. Um, I think possibly it's a sort of a, a linked question to Councillor de Gorn's there, but I didn't quite hear an answer on it. Um, but you said that you're expecting an increase in footfall. Uh, of what sort of magnitude are you thinking of you know 100 extra people 100,000 extra people where where are you what we've tried to do is to look with um um york mini golf to look at similar venues and look at other footfall of attractions um and um i think they've based their projections on the lowest um activity in the uh, city um and that would give sort of um, upwards of 20 30,000 visitors potentially a year um, to to visit the course, um, and, and I'm sure they can clarify that for you later. But um, uh, any percentage of that into the cafe um, to use the facilities to access the cafe or other things would be increased, um, and we hope that it will give a different demographic than maybe a traditional um, library users are. Councillor Melly, thank you, Chair. Um, I believe on the first floor of the library. There's a silent area, not just quiet like the rest of the library, but like a proper silent a reading room. room. Yeah, yes, that was called. Um, does that have windows that overlook this proposed development? Yes, it does. OK, so. Uh, with the current state of the building and any conditions that are in here, are you confident that there wouldn't be any noise from the development entering into that silent area? Um, you know, cons you know, Again, bearing in mind that children having fun can be quite noisy and piercing. Yeah, and I, I think probably one as a, a question maybe for the applicants, um, rather than me, because I, I am aware that there's been some acoustic studies done. Um, so maybe one for them, but um, you know, the windows are uh, ability to be closed and opened. Um, and um, there is noise out there when there's people, there, um, whatever activity it would be. That's a question that comes to mind. Um, this this path obviously is is welcome. In fact, that work was to that done to improve its accessibility. But it, given that this is a an income generating thing, will the general public still be allowed to use that during Absolutely. the opening hours? I think I'm not sure if that came out through the report. It's going to be helpful to clarify. That. Absolutely, that's still that's still open public access right the way through and up to the multangular tower. Okay, thank you. That's many. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of what the space is used for currently, is it always just open, kind of unused, quiet open space, or are there currently ever temporary events or one-off events? We've had pop-up events. Um, we took part in the Bloom Festival a few years back. Um, this year we've had um, some fun games and um, chess, a big um, portable uh, pop-up ch chess set um, on there. Um, different things, there's been musical venues, uh, theatre groups. Um, we've had various one-off things, but really, you know, for 90% of the time, it's there for um, just open use. 
Okay, I can't see any further questions. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. If we could move on then to uh, David Finch, who I believe is joined by Helen Burkett. Thank you. Um, speaking as the applicants and uh, answering questions. And I believe you're sharing your three minutes. You're sharing your three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you'd like to make a start in your own time. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Our vision for York Mini Goal is to create a fun and engaging activity that uniquely tells the complete story of York's history chronologically and inspires people to discover the city further. We also explain the rich variety of uses that Library Lawn has seen through the ages. There is a general consensus that Library Lawn in its current form is a quiet little known space. The conservation management plan emphasizes the need for direct interpretation on Library Lawn, a view that is echoed by Historic England and the Council of British Archaeologists in their assessment of this application. The conservation of heritage doesn't always mean to change nothing, as there is a responsibility within the conservation area to manage spaces positively, bring them to their optimum use and better reveal their significance. Our key design criteria have been to create an accessible attraction with a muted colour scheme and with features no higher than waist height, such that the first thing that catches the eye on entering the site remains the multangular tower. We will not be preventing any of the regular uses of the site. The hours of access are unaffected, the benches are still available, and significant areas of significant areas remain for visitors and walking tours to enjoy both St. Leonard's Hospital and the Multangular Tower, with enhanced access for wheelchair users. The only activity being prevented is antisocial behaviour. Our proposal seeks to broaden the appeal to a wider audience, from junior to grandparents. However, in broadening the appeal of the space, we will inevitably make it busier. Our objectors would rather it be a more exclusive space for those with an established interest in history, a quiet hideaway known only to a select few. However, one person's quiet and exclusive space can be isolating and intimidating to another, and many people actually prefer a public space to be a shared space and more vibrant. An isolated space is also a magnet to groups wishing to do deals in the dark corners of St. Leonard's Undercroft. The assessment of this application places the level of harm in the less than substantial category. This means that NPPF paragraph 202 is of primary importance, whereby members need to weigh the less than substantial harm against the public benefits, including securing its optimal viable use. 30 seconds left. To this end, paragraph 206 speaks hugely in favour of our proposal, which encourages local planning authorities to look for opportunities to better reveal the significance of heritage assets, which is exactly what we are proposing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I'll just ask if there are any questions. Councillor Oral? It's a, the application is for seven years. Why seven years? So we've got an agreement with Explorio to have six years operational. Oh, sorry, thank you, We have an, an agreement with Explore York to have six years of operational. When it came to applying for the planning permission, we realized that we needed to allow for the construction and the return to turf at the end. So we've applied for seven years to allow ourselves the flexibility to have the six years operational, but also do the construction at the start and the, the demolition at the end. Um, the reason for six years in itself to start with um, is, for one, this aligns very well with the longer term ambitions of Explore York, who know that it's going to take them several years for their long term plans. So they've set a very firm expectation with us that it is six years and no longer. Um, and actually, the time that this application has been in the process has actually made that even more definite than ever. Um, so the timing actually suits both sides. Um, there were a few people who have said to us, why not try it just for a year? But uh, Helen and I have found, 
funding this venture personally. Um, and um, the capital expenditure to do this simply will take several years to pay back. So we couldn't take the risk of basically losing our shirts over this. Um, so we need several years to effectively um, have certainty that we'll, we'll at least get our investment back for doing this. But that's not our motivation. We wanted to create something of a huge value for your. So it just fitted all around that that six year period was aligned to explore your and made it possible for us to actually do this. Okay, uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. And, uh, thanks for coming to see us this evening. Um, I just to, wanted to sort of understand it a little bit better because I'm, I'm trying to sort of visualise what it will be. So, from the drawing that's there, can you just talk us through? So, the the lawn is all removed, and then some bits of it are wood chipped. I, I wasn't sure how much of it's wood chipped, how much of it is paved or hard surface. Um, I think you're saying that plants will be in planters rather than planted in the, um, you know, in the ground, as it were. Um, but I just, I'm, I'm trying to sort of have a visualise what it is, and it's not so easy yeah. from a, a, a sort of two D picture that yeah. doesn't have a key. <laughs> okay, so if I talk you through, um, maybe from the top down. So at the multi-angular tower end, we've left there's approximately 150 square meters at that top end. Um, which we are leaving completely untouched. Um, so the Roman oven that was pointed out in the drawing um, earlier and upwards, as it were, uh, will be completely left as it presently is, which is a generous amount of space, we think. That's where the walking tours tend to assemble already. Uh, people can still picnic there. People can still uh, get close to the multangular tower, for example. Um, from that point downwards will be effectively the um, mini golf course. Um, which will be um, obviously the, the, the playing holes themselves in the bid 1 to 12. There's connecting paths, um, which um, it might not be completely clear, but we've designed it specifically that you don't have to pass through the holes, the playing spaces, to get through the paths. So people, if they did want to get close to the wall, would be free to explore. And we're actually saying that people are very free to read the interpretation boards as well, even if they're not playing. Um, and the paths do allow that, and they are fully accessible paths, of course, as well as the holes. Um, between the holes and the paths, um, for neatness and um, and for ease of maintenance, we propose it's majority bark chipped, with, um, as I said, um, planting that is no higher than waist height, which the the models in the course itself are also no higher than waist height. So that the eye line going across the site has uninterrupted views to the heritage on the other side, um, and that was a, a key design criteria that we that we gave our course designer. Um, so continuing down, obviously there's a variety of holes and connecting paths um, that allow the game to be played and allow people to explore around independently of the game. Um, that finishes um, at the point where it says E there. That's the end point. Um, and there, towards St. Anna's Hospital, again, there's about 100 square metres of space there, which is, again, out of bounds for the mini golf proposal. It's out of the scope of this application, but is being left as present, which presently is turf that that merges into pebbles, and the pebbles then continue in, into the undercroft of St. Leonard's Hospital. So that, again, gives a generous amount of space and free, uninterrupted access for people to explore St. Leonard's Hospital as well. Um, so the actual boundary of our lease is effectively the mini golf area. Um, the, the one other thing that probably does warrant explanation is that two meter buffer as well. Um, so we agreed that two meter buffer with Louisa Hood when she was in role as Bowers manager as, a, as an adequate buffer area between the course area and the wall. Um, that presently is about a metre of planted border before it gets to the grass at present. Um, and there's, I would say, a little bit of confusion between ourselves and the, the reviewing officer when we tried to explain. Um, she interpreted that as green, interpreting green meaning grass, and she was pressing that we should leave it as a, um, a grass path, as it were, or a narrow grass margin. Um, 
that wasn't our proposal from the start. It was a green space border, so, but is consistent with the rest of the landscape in the castle. And we think that would be more maintainable. We think that would look neater, um, a drainage to the wall, um, and certainly would not prevent, we agreed with Louisa Hood, would not prevent maintenance of the wall going forward. It's merely, um, it's, it's to provide that buffer area where we are not touching anything that close to the wall. And that would that would remain in Explore York's control, not ours. Okay. Can I ask if, if I could thank you, Chair? So just, Sorry, just, just, to, just to be really clear then. Um so the majority of that area that's the, the golf site, the, the turf would be removed. It, the brown mostly would be wood chip, and mm -hmm. then the pathways would be hard standing, presumably. Yes. Right? So, so it'd be sort of tarmac yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, that, that's helpful. I've got, I've got a bit of a picture and of the that. Bar, the bark chip had plants in it as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then what I just wanted to understand as well is that um, is your vision for this that this is uh, a year round attraction, um, that it's a summer only thing? Because um, presumably it's likely to be busier in the summer, but you know, I'm just trying to sort of get a gauge of whether you think it, you know, will it be seven days a week through the winter? Will it be more limited opening through the winter months and then through the summer? If you could just give us a sense of that, that'd be yeah. helpful. Well, of course, we don't, we don't know how it's going to pan out in terms of the business model, but um, we have modelled it around seven days a week uh, all year round. Um, but the hours will be just during daylight hours. So we're not proposing any flood lighting or anything of that nature. Um, so um, in the summer, we're proposing 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we think that that is actually positive for the city from what we've heard, that there's, there is an appetite to bridge the daytime and evening economy. So we feel that we would, it's surprising how many attractions close at five in York. Uh, so we, we, we hope that we would allow families to just stay on in York um, and, and enjoy the, the later economy and make it more family friendly for that to happen. So that's the summer um, till 8 p.m. And of course, daylight hours in the summer allow for that. Um, in the spring and autumn, we would need to reduce that to 10 till six because of dusk. And then in winter, we're proposing 10 till 3 p.m. Um, again, for the daylight purposes. But seven days. Still seven days is our proposal. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I can't see any further questions. So I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you very much. We're able then to move on to uh, questions to the officers. Councillor Melly. Um, in terms of this being a temporary application, there's a few points in the report where various people say that it isn't temporary, like various objectors and that sort of thing saying it isn't temporary. I was just wondering what is temporary use in planning terms? I think the only definition I could find in the report is Historic England's definition of temporary, but I wasn't sure what the planning definition of temporary is. Uh, there's a whole section in the report somewhere, um, Temporary Planning Commission 5.26. Um, so in terms of... Um, Temporary Planning Commission in planning terms, we don't consider it as temporary. Um, temporary is kind of weeks or months rather than permanent. And we don't feel that a condition would be appropriate to limit it to be temporary. It wouldn't be reasonable because of the permanent nature of the development. Um, it's not, for example, a tent that could be moved. Um, it wouldn't be reasonable to um, specify it's six years or whatever the temporary commission would be. So is that an MPPF thing or a local policy thing on, on what's temporary? Because um, again, the only mention that I can see of temporary events being days or weeks is the Historic England's guidance rather than... So the um, subheading above that, um, National Planning Practice Guidance, Use of Planning Conditions. I don't think it says anywhere in that paragraph that, temp that what time distance is considered temporary. Uh, no, but it says um, temporary permissions are usually only appropriate where a trial run is needed. 
in order to assess the effect of the development on an area or, or where it is expected that the planning circumstances will change in a particular way at the end of the period. So it might be, for example, the Spout project on Piccadilly, that's um, ahead of a larger regeneration project, so that would be like a temporary permission um, before something else happens. Um, Okay, any Councillor Melly? Um, another objection was about lighting and there being a worry that um, there would be blood lighting or other forms of lighting being used. Um, we've heard from the applicant that they don't intend to use lighting, in, but in terms of planning, would that require um, a, new, a, a, diff, a new planning permission or amended planning permission or would, would lighting be allowed in this, uh, in this permission? Um, if they were if they were to um, propose lighting fixtures, um, that would be developments in its own rights, uh, which would require planning permission. Um, I suppose a smaller scale might be considered to be de minimis uh, in terms of the light isn't development; the fittings are development. So you could have very small fittings that you might consider not to be development because they're so small scale but their impact might be an issue and you would condition that out if you felt that was a particular issue but the object so objections about concerns about flood lighting aren't really a planning concern in they this are a planning concern in they are potentially yeah. manageable through yeah. conditions okay. that's a crucial thanks chair um just trying to think how to sort of word this question because it, it's it's slightly off topic but it's i think it's sort of relevant in my understanding of the application so explore can currently do sort of temporary events in this space um but i think they probably would be typified by you know like a weekend event or a you know something that sticks up some gazebos and you, you sort of pop along for an afternoon is it the size and scale of this that is meaning that it requires a change of use? Or is it that there's a something on that site that says that you shouldn't have a, a longer term? I'm, I'm just trying to understand why you wouldn't try this for like six or eight weeks over the summer to prove its concept and then come back for something. But, but would you not be able to do that under the, the current planning use class? Um, it's not a change of use because it's operational development. Um, you know, it would obviously be a change of use as part of that, but um, the nature of building the course would mean it's not, you know, it wouldn't be suitable to put, take up all the turf for six weeks of use. Um, it's like a permanent um, structure. But you could, uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking about like, you know, City centre of Edinburgh, where they have the pitch and put, and you know those sorts of things. The harm would intrusive, be, but, but the but harm would be it, reduced it would be the, by the yeah. if it was you know movable and it was six weeks. Yeah, but I don't. We haven't assessed that in terms of this is not what's being proposed here. Yeah, so it's the it's the size and scale that then requires the the use class and yeah yeah I think I'm understand. Thank you. Any further questions? I can't see any, so we're happy then to move into debate if anybody's willing to make a start. And start picking on someone, Councillor Melly. Um, it's really nice to see a creative an application for something creative and interesting mixed up a bit when they have these long meetings. Um, I think this development would have a lot of benefits to it. It's got educational benefits. Um, it includes long term improvements such as making the path accessible, um, reducing antisocial behaviour in the area, income for the library. Um, yes, I guess what we need to do is balance that up against harm to the setting of heritage assets. Um, I think it's established there isn't harm to 
archaeology, just the above ground heritage assets. So what I'm trying to kind of assess is whether this is harm to the setting of listed buildings and heritage assets or whether it just changes the setting and maybe means that more people come into the area to appreciate it. Um, I'm, yeah, still concerned about and not completely understanding this Roman oven um, because from the photos, it doesn't seem like it's currently protected in any way. It's at ground level and can be walked on and has public access. So yeah, I'm wondering whether that has increased harm because of this development or not. Um, but I'm minded to approve. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to the aims and objectives and um, getting uh, people with disabilities involved as well and making it more uh, disability friendly, if you like. But uh, there's a lot of concerns about the impact on this on this area uh, and on the historic site. So I'm not convinced of it at the moment, but um, I'll wait and hear what other people have to say. Okay, Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. I think this has many, many, many things to commend it. Um, you know, I think it's something that we would like in the centre of York, but I cannot get past the fact that I think it's on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. I think this is not an appropriate use for that particular place. It's a quiet area. It's a very nice area at the moment. I'll visit it for the first time. I didn't even know that it existed. This planning application came up. No, when I'd look around and lots of people sitting quietly, having picnics and whatever on a sunny afternoon. And I think that's what it should be used for. So I'm sorry, I cannot support this application, even though I would love the applicant to find another site in the city centre, which had less harm to the heritage of York, because I think there is a lot to commend it. But I just think that's the wrong site. Uh, Councillor Gorn and then yeah. I, I have to, um, I tend to, to agree that I think the nature of, of this sounds somewhat alien to the setting um, and the, the length, I can understand the rationale as to why such a long period of time would be required, but it does feel like um, significant commitment to an unproven uh, concept. I know there are uh, golf, many golf courses elsewhere, but the, the setting here is very sensitive. And I appreciate that the library, um, particularly, you know, looking for other ways of uh, supporting the income, which is, is, is equally an important consideration. Um, I think my, my concern about it is, is just the, the nature of the whole set up is, is somewhat incongruous compared to the historic context um, that it would be set in. And, and to a certain extent, you know, if, if it was, as you say, if it was a trial period for, uh, you know, the summer period or a, a one season, then that, that might be, be seen as more acceptable initial trial and test out people's reactions and so on and see whether the business concept is right but it's the length of time as well seems to be a, a significant commitment uh, for us to make. Uh, Councillor Melly. Thank you Chair. Um, just in response to what other committee members have said, the um, thing is that it's, it's not always currently a quiet space, it is already used for other purposes for temporary events for temporary structures um so i don't i don't think it's completely correct to characterize it as a space that's always quiet for contemplation or whatever and it's in an area of the city where it's surrounded by plenty of other space for that sort of quiet usage it's right next to the library it's also surrounded by lots of other outdoor space that can be used quietly um so I'm not sure that that would be it's necessarily going to be a loss of needed quiet space. Um, you know, we've heard that some people don't even know that the area is there. How can the the heritage and these you know wonderful historic um, assets be appreciated if you don't even know 
the areas there, I feel like this will bring people in to actually appreciate those assets that we have. Um, uh, and uh, in response to what was just said about a trial period to see if it works, I think it says in the report that it you it, you wouldn't, hold on a sec, I'll find the page. Uh, the National Planning Practice Guidance says that it's rarely justifiable to grant a second temporary permission. So if permission was granted to do it on a very short-term basis, then that kind of rules out, <laughs> if it is shown to be successful, that rules out actually doing it temporarily in the future rather than permanently in the future, um, which is a bit of a tricky piece of planning guidance for this situation. Okay, Councillor Croshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm usually really up for sort of really playful things. And I like the idea of the city being more playful. And uh, I also really like the idea of, um, you know, finding new and different and innovative ways to sort of engage with the heritage assets that we have in the city. Um, but I, I, I can't, I'm I, what I'm trying to imagine is I'm trying to imagine me taking my kids along to play mini golf in this location. And I, I just can't really see it happening. And even if I did, I'm not sure that I would then be focusing on the multangular tower or the city walls or you know any of those other things. Whereas as it currently is, I have taken my kids into that space because it's actually quite magical to come around the corner and see this kind of... Um, big open space that is quite quiet and I do fully appreciate what the um, applicant said about you know not wanting to preserve something for the exclusivity of people who know about it um, but that's actually as much about how we share our existing heritage as it is about sticking something in there to kind of drag people there despite the fact that it's already a beautiful space so I don't I think if the officer recommendation had have been approved and I'd been sort of unsure, I, I don't think I would necessarily be kind of fighting to refuse it. But at the same time, I'm sort of looking at it and I'm going, well, I, I agree. I, I, I think it does impact the setting of these really important assets in not a complementary way. Um, and I do worry about it might look absolutely wonderful in August when it's really busy, but it might really be a significant detractor in January when it's quiet and it's pouring with rain and it's all looking a little bit sorry for itself. Um, so I think it's it's a it's it's a a reasonable idea with really laudable aims in the wrong place, and and I can't get away from that, unfortunately. I think my part. Yeah. Say, so I think for my part, I, I do have huge sympathy with the, with the aims of the of the proposal. Um, I think, as people have said, it it would be nice to get a bit more of a sort of playful aspect to the the city centre, um, get a bit more interest, some more different uses. I think, and I think for me, the the uh, crucial paragraph is five point two nine, where it has sort of reminders that. In planning terms, this isn't a, a temporary permission. We would effectively be granting what would amount to a permanent permission. Uh, and I think for me, as, as much as I'd love to see something like this, that, that is a step too far. Um, so I think I would also be supporting the officer's refusal. But if we've reached the end of the debate stage, if somebody's happy to, to move the officer's recommendation. Uh, Councillor Dalkney. Thank you, Chair. Um, I considered this application very carefully and thought about the times I spent in that space, which I was introduced to a long time ago. Um, many of us don't appreciate the St. Thomas's Hospital. Yeah. used to be the largest hospital in Europe, uh, north of the Alps. The Montango Town, we all know well. Uh, amongst all those heritage assets, I just couldn't see this uh, fitting in well, and I consider it to be incongruous development, really. So I, I'm happy to to move the officer recommendation, but with reluctance, because I, I consider that it will be a great scheme, but somewhere else in the city. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Anybody willing to second that? Councillor Oral? Thank you. Uh, so that's being proposed and seconded. Uh, Gareth, if you could just give us a quick summary. Thank you, Chair. So that um, uh, the officer recommendation is that uh, the application be refused to the three three reasons on page 41 and 42 of the agenda. Okay, thank you. Could I then see all those in favour of the proposal? All those against? Okay, I think that is everybody, so that is refused. Okay, thank you very much. I think if we're able to move straight on to item 4C. Okay, thank you, Chair. So this is a uh, planning application at the former Bootham and Monkwood Conservative Club, uh, 77 to 79 Clarence Street, for the erection of a two and three storey, 34 room student accommodation building, following demolition of the existing buildings on the site. So I'll just take you through the uh, scheme drawings and then the, uh, the, the uh, Planning officer, case officer, Rachel Tice is here. Three questions. So the site, uh, in red, Clarence Street, uh, to the east, Union Terrace to the west. Uh, it's outside, but adjacent to the Central Historic Core Conservation Area, which runs along um, Union Terrace. Uh, some photographs of the site. So it's these uh, these three buildings here. And the other directions, Clarence Street, obviously. Those three buildings. Union Terrace uh, behind this tree. So it's the uh, this building, the lighter red brick. And then the two beyond that terminating at the building with the blue door. And um, uh, seven flats in that building, that three-story building to the uh, to the northern side. This building here is also uh, in uh, residential use. And then looking from the other direction, so looking southwards, there's the extent of the site there. So the layout plan, uh, you would have seen the building was uh, it's entirely covers the sides. Um, this proposal is pinched in slightly from the sides to give access from Union Terrace. Uh, there's also an access from uh, Clarence Street, which we felt was a very important uh, uh, to retain that access. Elevations. So this is the elevation to Union Terrace. And then the elevation facing north. Clarence Street access with a small forecourt um, retained in front, uh, matching the forecourt that's there at the moment. And then southwest elevation, which uh, faces into the the courtyard of that uh, two-storey red brick um, residential development I showed before. These are the street scene elevations. Uh, the floor plans. Round first. Uh, second and the roof floor plan with some uh, solar 
PV on the roof. Um, Google Earth image, actually always helpful in these sort of landlock situations. So this is the extent of the site. See how the area uh, between the two larger buildings is entirely covered by um, by building residential to the north, two blocks there, and then residential to the south. And then looking for the different um, different direction. Okay, the extent of the site there. Um, this is a photograph from probably here, I guess. Right? Just showing the existing uh, the existing relationship. Um, between the buildings. Those visualizations are old, so yeah, they've been superseded. Do you have an update? Thank you, Gareth. Um, just a very short update. Two additional conditions are recommended. One, um, specifying that the windows on the northeastern elevation, um, which, serve, which are to serve a corridor, are obscure glazed. Um, and, an, and a second additional condition requiring details of proposed boundary treatments to the northeast and southwest boundaries. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from the committee on the presentation? That's so crucial. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to um, understand just the, the nature of the accommodation because I was trying to sort of picture it all. So it's 34 rooms essentially all in, interconnected it's not they're not in sort of blocks of flats or anything like that are they they're termed clusters so they say between four and six rooms and then they share a, a common room with a kitchen some kitchen right. facilities because that's I'd, I'd sort of that's what i've been trying to get my head around because see on these two floor plans here i can see how if you're in the sort of bottom of the building or the top of the building you've got a kind of a you know a bunch of rooms and then a like a sort of communal area mm -hmm. but then what there seems to be is a sort of corridor in between the two that with then just three or four rooms sort of on it and and i was trying to sort of is is as you understand it is is the idea that anybody from any room would use any communal area but that you might potentially be more likely to use one side of the building or the other because I just I just think there's a potential for those people in the, that middle space to not really belong either in one communal area or the other communal area and therefore you're sort of building in a kind of isolation that's kind of what I was the, worried about the applicant is here who will be able to okay. clarify later okay. but there are, there are four rooms which are studios so um they've got their own kitchen facilities so I think probably the intention so is that they can be ones. more independent right Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions at this point? Okay. Okay. So I think we have got the applicants here to speak. If you'd like to join us, if if. Yeah, we've got to speak. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Councilor Groshaw? If I can put that question to you, to you then. I, as I say, I just was trying to understand how you envisage the building working and, and my worry being that those flats in the middle potentially don't belong to one side or the other and then you, you're almost building in an isolation for, for people. So would you be able to introduce yourselves as well? Before? Yeah. Good evening. Um, yeah, my name's Nick Watson, um, and I represent the architect. Um, so the answer to the question is that there's there's eight studios, there's four on for the first floor and four on the second, and they they are self-contained with their own cooking facilities, um, but they do have access to the ground floor shared lounge, um, and the rest of the rooms are uh, are in clusters, so they're effectively um, shared apartments of between four and five bedrooms. And they they then they don't have their own cooking facilities within their rooms, 
but they then share the kitchen and living space at the end of the corridor. So in which case, what I would understand then is that you, you've effectively got whatever it is, three or four sort of flats, for want of a better term, and then on each floor, four self, completely self-contained units, basically. That's right, yeah. yeah. So on the ground floor, it's um, two, two apartments um, with no studios. And then on the first floor, you've got two apartments and four studios. Um, and I think it's the same on the second floor as well, from memory. So it's a mixture of different types of units. Just if I if I could add as well, it's worth just advising that the scheme has been designed in conjunction with York St John University with their requirements. They're also here as well, but the scheme has been bespoke designed for them in line with their requirements and forms part of their pledge for first year accommodation. In terms, so the mix, uh, the quality of the space, etc., has gone through a number of iterations and designs to to get to where we are now which have been done in conjunction with the university thank you that, that that's helpful um and so is your understanding then that this would be uh, basically a first year block of flats and then people stay for a year and, and move on and and um you, you may or may not be able to answer that but just in terms of the, the way that the rooms are used then is it envisaged that these kind of clusters would be so if you're in one of those self-contained units, you wouldn't be able to access one of those clusters. That would be much more like a flat. So the the ones that are the self-contained rooms, um, you, there's a another lounge on the ground floor. Uh, on the ground floor plan, you'll see that next to the staircase is a lounge there, and that's that's available to all the residents of the building. Yeah. Okay. I think I understand how the building will work. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay, uh, Councillor Gorn. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions um, with conditions about the management of the site in terms of um, arrival and departures. Um, I appreciate that it's uh, intended as no car development, presumably on the basis it being close to York St. John. I mean, how, how does that, how is it envisaged that that will take place? Um, both at the start and end of, of term, but also sort of deliveries and things like that. Um, I thought it was probably easier if I answered that, since we were intending to enter into a, a long-term uh, uh, long arrangement for the property. So um, as you said, it's very close to the campus. So deliveries, centrally handled for uh, deliveries and post uh, on the main campus um, so one delivery a day uh, or the students come and collect their parcels from uh, a location on on campus um, in terms of uh, arrivals at uh, the beginning and end of the academic years that's dealt with that as with all of our accommodation on a time slot booked basis so um, traffic doesn't overwhelm with students arriving uh, and they're, they're usually um, quite well spread out over the, the period of that, that first week uh, in the academic year. So there wouldn't be any reason to deviate from that arrangement. And um, we already have uh, one property on Clarence Street where that, that works as well as any, any of our other sites. Can I just clarify, um, I mean that's really good to hear about the sort of postal deliveries and things being centralised. Um, obviously, there will be some instances of uh, deliveries of takeaways or Amazon or whatever that come direct to the site. Would that would that be accessible from either Clarence Street or from from Union Terrace, or how how would that work? Uh, um, Amazon deliveries, we have a centralised uh, Amazon locker on, on campus again, mm -hmm. so um, it, it's very rare that uh, deliveries, other than the ones you've mentioned, takeaway type deliveries would be delivered to the uh, to the residents directly. Um, that happens on some of our other residences, but uh, less so on the ones that are closer to the campus because those students are so close to awesome. the um, the takeaway outlets along Gilligate, for example, and, and in the centre, that um, it's less relevant. Okay, thank you. And one other question is, um, in terms of the the students, 
uh, I know there's a proposal for one disabled space, but what about other students? Um, I'm conscious that you, depending on who, which students it is made available to, you will have some students who require a car because of the nature of their course. Um, and how is that managed? So that's that's managed through um, uh, the, the application process. So uh, students are expected to identify their needs. Some students are on placements, so mm -hmm. uh, a lot of nursing uh, and other allied health students, mind, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. trainee teachers. Uh, as far as possible, we obviously try and um, source those placements either within York or uh, on public transport routes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're provided with higher cars, but that's all factored into the um, allocation of accommodation. Uh, there is there's one fully accessible room there, but there are other rooms that cater for students with um, uh, ambulant mobility issues. So um, uh, that's things like level access showers. Um, so it's not just one, one room, um, mm -hmm. but that's part of the reason for our interest in, in this site and this, this proposal okay. with it being so close to campus, it, it helps us with um, the substantially higher than average percentage of uh, disabled students that we have applying to us. Thanks. And just one other question, which might not be for yourself, which is about the, we've got um, a CMP, Construction Environment Management Plan. So it's it's more to do with the construction process. So I don't know who would, would answer the range. Okay. Um, I can see there's obviously there are the, the standard conditions about noise and uh, dust and things like that. Um, we've seen the constraints nature of the site. Um, I suppose the question is, how is it proposed that you would, where would you have the compound and contractor parking? Uh, and would there be a, a problem with that being specified? That, that you should identify that as part of the uh, application process? Um, yeah, I'm going to struggle to answer that one, unfortunately. Um, at this stage, we don't have a contractor appointed, and normally that, that is dealt with by them. Um, and it's it's dependent on how they how the method of construction and deliveries and all sorts. Um, but um, we have dealt with other sites in York on, on, tight, on, on tight sites. Um, so um, I, I assume the conditions there is it asking for a CEMP? I assume, yeah. I guess I guess that's the next stage. Sorry, I can't so give you any more detail on that. Okay. Okay. Can't see any further questions there. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Are there any further questions from the committee for the planning officers? Councillor Melly. Thank you, Chair. Um, seeing as so much to do with access is left up to um, future agreements, um, future travel plans and future management plans and that sort of thing. Um, I'm just wondering whether, um, so there's three entrances and in the plans there's already one that's primary, one that's secondary and one that's additional. Does that have it, does approving now which one is the primary entrance, which is one that's the secondary entrance, limit these future travel and management agreements if access for things like deliveries taxi pick up and drop off and that sort of thing is possibly more appropriate on union terrace rather than clarence street but the primary access is on clarence street for example yeah i think there's um i think highways have asked that um any deliveries takes place from union terrace and that will be in the travel plan and the student student management plan condition i think it's specified that the ideally it should be from Union Terrace, but I don't think it limits the use. I think it's quite, you know, the Union Terrace when that one leads to the cycle, the bike stores, and then there's the main entrance from the street, which you'd want a main entrance to be from Clarence Street for pedestrians. So I think it's that's sort of gone. Follow up with that question. Is uh I mean we've got is is there any conditions about the hours and noise and things management I, I i think there's something there's there's a student management plan but would that in, extend to um trying to put in place arrangements that 
limit the disturbance to residents in the in Union Terrace? Yeah, I think it, it covers that. I think it kind of um, asks of the university that, you know, this constant liaison with, you know, and should there be complaints, that's all in place. I think that, that's what that document will set out. Just the first the condition again. It's condition 24 on page 119. Okay, so it's condition 24. Um, there are... Uh, uh, the bullet points uh, strategy for dealing with any complaints from the public, measures to monitor and avoid excessive noise, and uh, that student tenancy agreements include clauses relating to noise and antisocial behaviour, and then arrangements for well, that's the uh, departure, yeah, so those ones, and arrangements for control of taxis and, uh, and drop offs, um, taxis and uh, deliveries, rather. I'm conscious we don't have a representative from highways here, but I do have, um, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this as a, as a question, but there's significant concern um, in relation to the layout of a one-way system, such as it is that's in place there. At the moment, the uh, if the primary point of access for deliveries and taxes and so on is at the rear of the building, then unless access is taken from the junction next to the Sainsbury's, then the, you have to do a three point turn to come back out again. And I can Im well imagine that the, the residents in that street, if they're going to be subjected to a lot of bleeping and you know slamming of doors and so on, uh, late at night, so that is going to be a significant issue. Um, but my my problem is that uh, I can't see how, other than conditioning that deliveries and so on should take place by accessing from Sainsbury's and then going out the other way. Then your alternative to that would be to actually make Union Terrace a one way street, so you could only could only access from that point. Um, but then that obviously has wider implications and obviously couldn't be conditioned by this one particular um, application. So really, I'm, I'm just raising that as a as a concern that might need to be looked at. And more specifically, the, the CEMP, um, I do wonder whether we couldn't condition any uh, site deliveries being by approach from the, the city direction which would mean that you can turn left in by Sainsbury's and then come straight out the other way because otherwise you can have you know any number of contractors arriving doing three-point turns and amongst the residents to get back out again once they've come in from the from the southern entrance if you see what I mean so the question really is, is can we condition during the construction that the that, that um, site access for, for um, materials and, and deliveries during construction is from the Sainsbury's end on the junction, rather than coming from, because because if you come in from the southern end, then you've got to do a three point turn to get back out again. So there is there isn't a condition on this for um, I can't remember what they call it a high uh, a, um, a highway yeah. sort of transport so construction. Oh, that's what I'm asking for. Yeah, yeah. we. So it would be uh, again if you feel it's sorry, that was loud enough. If you feel it's um, if you feel it's reasonable, uh, uh, <laughs> necessary for this uh, for this scheme, then that's something that yeah. could be. Uh, I mean, I, just in terms of evidence of the need i am aware that that since the 
Sainsbury's has been established there's been regular complaints from residents about just that that that, that um, feature of a design that any vehicles coming in from from the end have to do three point turns and and to, to exit the site after they've done the drop off and adding into a mix you know not just the deliveries for Sainsbury's but further construction vehicles it, it, it would be a lot simpler and safer for all concerned if the access was in a one way direction uh, for those vehicles. That's Melly. Um, yeah, I, I went up again. Um, there's a um, site location, location plan on page 125. What we're talking about is what's labelled as Groves Chapel. Um, but yes, absolutely. Like there's a restriction there. You can only go in one way. And so actually, what happens with large vehicles for deliveries is they don't bother with that system at all. They park on the pavement on Clarence Street and obstruct pavement and the roads and that's what they do instead because there is a highways issue there and I can see that being exacerbated in maybe not so much once the development's complete when we're talking about cars more than large vehicles but for construction traffic I also agree that that could potentially be an issue it'd be handy to have someone from highways having input onto that okay there's no further questions we're happy to move into debate and I'll Look and see if anybody's willing to make a start. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think that it is a shame that we lose uh, two mid 19th century buildings. Um, I note the conservation officer has said that they, you know, shouldn't be, couldn't be considered as non designated heritage assets and they're not in the conservation area. So, you know, we don't have any grounds to, to fight it on, on that basis. Um, and I often I think of picked fights on the community use. Um, and um, I think it's local plan policy HW3. And at 5.7, page 101, it has a phrase which I really did have a nice chuckle to myself about, which is that the former use of the buildings as a conservative club are not considered to be a use providing facilities essential for the day to day needs of the community. And I frankly couldn't agree more. Um, so with those two kind of possible realms of, of um, avenues for where I might have, have sort of asked questions, I do, I do think there are issues around um, delivery access and, and those sorts of things. Um, uh, so I'm being slightly flippant in, in one sense. Um, there are some genuine concerns, but on the whole, on the balance of, of all these things, I, I, I don't see any grounds by which we would um, have a strong reason to refuse this. Um, it's, it just is what it is. Okay, uh, Councillor Melly. Um, seeing as the council that would usually raise this question isn't here, I'll do it. Um, in condition eight, why is the soft and hard landscaping scheme limited to 10 years from the completion of the development being replaced if they die or become removed or damaged or diseased, et cetera, rather than in perpetuity? It can be changed. Um, I think that's the is that still that's still the condition we as far as I'm aware we landscape architect gives us. Yeah, it is the condition sold by the landscape architects. And we I've it's I guess it's horses courses really, uh, in, in terms of whether we require it in perpetuity or whether we allow them to change the scheme, as I've said before, that if if they take out the landscaping and replace it with something uh, that is development in its own right, then that would require planning permission. Um, that there's this this issue of do you do you require uh, a, a building owner to come back and say they want to change the type of shrubs forevermore? Or well, they want to replace a tree with a different tree, which is what that um, what that condition does. But removing vegetation isn't development, is it? No. So yeah, so yes, they could they could remove the, the vegetation without without um, uh, without permission. Um, so why would they if they're not going to use it for something else that would require permission? This is an issue about how far you want to go on relatively limited bits of internal um, internal 
open space. But it's up to you. Is it only relating to the internal open space or is it relating well, to the frontage on Clarence Street? Yeah, no. it's all of all of the all the landscaping, so yeah, includes the frontage. Um yeah, because surely either the um hard and soft landscaping and vegetation is you know a reasonable condition and necessary for the development or it's okay if the vegetation is all removed in 10 years right <laughs> yeah i mean I, I i don't think that i don't think just because you, put, you don't put the condition on it means that the clock's ticking and they'll remove it it's it's it's, I suppose it's it, uh, it's the same way I answer all these questions on on the on the uh, um, on the landscaping condition. It's how far you you feel it, it is necessary to go in terms of. Normally, you you, you take the view that um, after ten years, it's all established, and therefore doesn't need that uh, doesn't need that doesn't need that protection of. Uh, of a condition that requires you to re replace it, and that was always the that was always going back to the original um, condition circulars. That was always the reason why those conditions were put on. It was about you know allowing things to establish, not not keeping them forever. But again, it's up to you, Councillor yeah. Gong. But on a different point, um, returning to my questions to the applicant, um, can we? Condition is part of the CEMP that the site compound and um, parking for contractors' vehicles is as agreed with the local authority. Obviously, they haven't appointed anybody at the moment, but can we agree, you know, given the constraints of the site, can we agree that that should be conditioned to identify uh, a suitable location for that? Because if you look at, I mean, if, if you have a look at the street on street view there's some residents parking but there's very little space other than that other than blocking the, the highway yeah that's a standard that's one of the standard bullet points in that that condition okay. i mean there's no there, there isn't any there isn't any parking that's not residents parking there anyway yeah. so um so but w lines have to find somewhere else to go yeah but double the yellow lines allow deliveries, don't they? Which they're doing when they're unloading a load of sheeting or whatever. Yeah, well, deliveries would be yes. Usually. So, so you know, we can if we can condition the arrangements for that. Yes, with <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> See where I'm going. I? I, I don't. Yeah, we wouldn't normally get into a. It would. I think it would be beyond our enforcement powers just because we only have four enforcement officers yeah. to to have some sort of arrangements so that's all, all the more reason to get it agreed in advance as to how it's going to work yeah but then no, there speaking with experience here there isn't an option of i don't think there's an option of not stopping on wl lines and yeah no, sorry but but obviously if i if there's a compound that means they've got to hire somewhere that they that where materials can be stored and then delivered from there to the site as as they're needed rather than trying to store them on site yeah i guess as, as the, the speaker said it depends yeah. what construction techniques they use in terms of how much they have to store yeah. on site if anything yeah. I, I mean but it is i'm raising this particularly because of the constrained nature of the site and the fact that you've only got highways on either side yeah but for storage if you're going to try and build something there yes I'm not disagreeing. I'm just that there is a limit so to can, how far the, there is a limit to how far the, when the site is so constrained. Yeah, I just don't want to raise expectations that we would be able to to, to mitigate against any um, temporary obstruction. By no, no. Well, what, well, what I'm asking for is the, the the detail of the site compound and contractor parking is is to be agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any Councillor Melly? Um, it does say on the construction environment management plan condition that it will include deliveries, yeah, details of deliveries, prefabrication off site, that sort of thing. In that, yeah, in the camp. So, do you feel that's enough?
just for clarity, if this is a this is if this is a standard wording that you have here, I think there's you know particular circumstances of a very constrained site where we do need to some assurance about practical arrangements that are not going to well there are, there's obviously going to be adverse impact on residents whilst it's regardless of what how you organize it but it's minimizing the the impact rather than expecting to use union terrace as a site site provision you know which we have seen elsewhere in the city happen um uh, the the wording of condition 15 is a is an environmental impact um to mitigate environmental impact so that that's that section there isn't isn't necessarily designed to to cover the issues that councillor de gore is um is raising that would need a separate condition to, more more specific to the uh the, the the parking the deliveries in terms of traffic impacts yeah I mean, it's something that, you know, any contractor is going to have to, to work out. It's just it would be helpful to plan it in advance rather than yeah. the enforcement officers running around every five minutes to try and sort out chaos. Yeah, and the, the yeah the condition should should cover that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a question. Yeah, I'm just going to say, so presumably we can just do a defer to chair and vice chair for a condition that encapsulates something along those lines that's just a little bit tighter it's a it's a relatively it is standard condition there is a standard condition which is devised by highways um, development management offices uh, that we impose so just for clarity uh, i would also add that one about the direction of approach if if that would help to uh yeah minimize the, the sort of turning movements in the geography of that particular site yeah it, the, the the standard condition does um does include the routing of construction vehicles but is that for making it more specific okay. that's what else okay if we reach the end of debate then is anybody willing to move the officer's recommendation councillor oral move it chair is anybody willing to second? Councillor Dogney? Okay, Gareth, if you could give us a. So the, the recommendation was that uh, permission be uh, approved, um, subject to uh, the conditions in the report, uh, section one of six agreements. Uh, the, two, um, the two conditions that uh, were outlined um in the update and then the additional condition with the um the, the highway construction management plan um with the addition of the uh the information regarding the um the direction of travel on on union terrace from Clarence street okay if i could then see all those in favor okay i think that's everyone Okay, so that's approved. Would members like five minutes? Yeah. Okay. We back by five past. Chair, I'm going to take my leave because otherwise I'm going. I'm afraid I'm not going to wait another hour. For us. <laughs>
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, and if we can move on to item 4D. Uh, thank you, Chair. So this is uh, an application for, this is a, an existing HMO. Um, we've, as is often the case, when is an existing HMO without a planning permission or a stiff of lawfulness, we, we've asked them to, uh, to, to show some, um, uh, some evidence, uh, and they have supplied evidence that uh, that this has been op in operation for a, a, a significant period of time. Um, so the proposal is for a, a two-story side extension, single-story rear extensions, a dormer to the rear, bin and bicycle storage structure to the side, uh, following the demolition of the garage. So uh, this increases the um, the, the number of bedrooms at the building. So uh, a series of photographs. Uh, so uh, front elevation and the rear elevation. So that's from the end of the street, uh, Beedale Avenue. And then another elevation, uh, which uh, picks up the dormer that's already in existence. On number 10, Beedale Avenue. Uh, the application drawings, so two story side extension, single story rear extension, dormer to the rear, and then this um, bin and bike store to the side. and uh, Google Street View showing the site and its environs. So, you know, close to that junction um, and in common with many of these areas in Osbaldwick with these, these narrow grass villages, um, although yeah. not all the way in the street, interesting. There is a... Find it. There is an update. Um, condition four, which requires the, the construction and retention of the of the bin and bicycle store, um, suggests an addition of a, another sentence dating that waste and recycling shall not be stored otherwise than within the approved bin store. Um, I did send around the Council of Water spoke on this item at the beginning. I did send around Thursday that um, recent appeal decision from Derrimore, uh, Derrimore Drive. Um, there are there are some differences. There are some similarities. Um, that was received after this report was written. Um, the inspector dismissed the appeal on Derrimore Drive because. They considered that the car parking spaces should be larger uh, than the normal 4.8 by 2.4 um, car parking spaces uh, to allow for independent use uh, and access, um, just taking into account the nature of a, of a shared house. Uh, and also in that case, um, there was concern that the the, the, the constrained nature of the frontage of the sites meant that uh, it would block access to the bin and bike stores. Um, so it's not quite the same in this situation because the issue with the bin and bike store uh, wouldn't arise here. But it, it is true to say that the, uh, the, the site frontage is, is constrained. Uh, let me just blow that up. It's not good. Uh, so they are they're not the they're not the larger spaces um and it would be uh it it would be very difficult i think for there to be three cars parked on that frontage that would to be um uh that could be accessed independently uh, so potentially you're looking at a you're looking at a situation where if the occupiers had 
had three cars, then one of them likely parked on the street because I, I, I don't think that it would be so usable, so easy um, to to access those two um, those two in that location directly to the front of the bay window. Potentially, you could uh, you could require the the bin and bike store to be moved further back. Uh, allowing this parking space to be moved further back, which would give a bit of a turning head, but whether that would be of um, practical use is a, is a different matter. So it's, um, I think the issue in, in front of us here is that normally uh, where, there's a, where there's a parking issue in the streets, uh, we would normally require those, those three parking spaces and it's, it's unlikely that more than two would be provided. Okay. Are there any questions on the plans, Councillor Melly? Um, we heard from the public speaker earlier, and also from the parish council, that there are parking issues on the highway. Um, is that um, the highway's view as well? That there's parking pressures in the immediate vicinity? Then they've not been specific, um, but they uh, they have. Uh, they have stated that it would be preferred if they could provide three parking spaces to the frontage. And there is, you'll recall, um, not that long ago, we dealt with an application, similar thing, an extent. Uh, no, it's a change of use to, to of an extended house, which appears on the map. Um, so uh, 27 Beedale Avenue, so that one on the corner. And that was a similar situation where you could, with care, park three cars on the frontage. And I think this, the, uh, the public speaker submitted a photograph to it saying, you know, there's, there's never three cars parked there, it's only two and they park elsewhere. We, uh, the committee took the view that because that side road along the side of 27 Beedale um, didn't have a house with a direct access to it, that, that street parking was acceptable in that location. So here, um, the street's narrow. You could only park on one side. Um, you've also got the, the, the corner here. Um, so there are there are there are constraints. That's a question. Thanks. Just picking up on that then. So um, just to be clear, we can require. A maximum of one parking bay per two bedrooms. That's right, isn't it? That's our that's our guideline. Yeah. Um, and then just in terms of looking at that, so you know, having us gone round and round and round trying to protect a hedge for a very long time earlier on, it does seem like the very obvious solution there would be to remove that bit of hedge and create three straight on parking. Is that not something that's been considered or possible? On the frontage, yeah, they they wouldn't. Um, Streetworks team um, have already uh, granted uh, an access. Um, uh, sorry, a, a, a crossover. That's the word I was looking for, um, which is wider than what's existing. But they wouldn't now, uh, under their current uh, guidance, um, grant permission for a, a full width as far as I'm aware. So uh, they, they wouldn't grant permission of a crossover, which would allow three no's in, I understand. Um, there was uh, a, a, an original, I think the original plan uh, showed a new um, parking space uh, here. So you'd have one on the side and you know larger area for two, but that was withdrawn uh, by the applicant that was a telegraph pole in the way and presumably the the, the costs that way the, the 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 benefits there okay any further questions Councillor Melly would this change the size of the HMO from a small HMO to a large HMO or does it keep it within the same class of HMO they um they're showing it that yeah, so it's it's an extension to the existing, so that's that would retain that that six um, that six occupancy. 
uh, it does show two does show two lounges. Um, so you know we've, we've had this situation before where potentially you could um, uh, you could change one of those rooms into a bedroom, but um, you, you you should apply for planning permission to change the use there. Okay. Uh, not in terms of what we've been shown, but it does say it's an existing HMSO. Is it on our database? We're it often, is. Um, we're often told that they're not. Um. Um. um I don't know if it was on database. Right. Um, it it is uh, if it if it isn't it, it would be now because we let them know well we yeah. let the people who administer I mean, that's the point I'm making that if it's not we should make yeah I'm, I'm afraid because it was existing and because they showed us information that shows that it had been in place um, Yeah, it's lawful um, either because it yes. predated the HM, mm -hmm. um, the the Article Four, or it's been in place for ten years. Yeah, we didn't go any further than that, mm -hmm. um, but um, it's something that would be added to the database now. In this case, okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Not just on the um, plans. If there's any general questions as well. Not if we're happy to move into debate. Who's willing to next start, Councillor Oral? Yeah, it seems from what Gareth said about the um, planning inspector decision, it seems very relevant to this. Uh, and it's not demonstrating clearly enough that there are the three parking spaces required. So. Uh, I would not be supporting this application. Okay, Councillor Melly. Can I just double check that policy to do with parking spaces? Was it maximum number or minimum number? Because I thought there was a question earlier where you said it was the maximum number is two is one space per two bedrooms. Um, Councillor Crawshaw used the word maximum, and. Um, uh, so, so the, the planning pol planning policy that exists is in the development control local plan, and that expresses those as a maximum. The maximum parking standards are um, discouraged in the MPPF unless they're justified for particular reasons. So, uh, so I think our highways colleagues use the highways design guide, which which has those also has those one. Um, one space but two HMO bedroom standards as well. I don't think it says minimum. I just think it says guideline. I thought it was the maximum that we could require. No, the 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 maximum was in the uh, uh, the maximum was in the development control local plan. But um, that we shouldn't really be using maximums until perhaps we devise some new ones. But the inspector in that case thought it should have the inspector in the Derrimore Drive case. I mean, that was a that was a, I think that was a seven bed. It was going part of the application was to take it to uh, take it out of the C four class, um, and the inspector determined that in in that location, uh, the the number of spaces that were required was um, was necessary. Um, but that was, uh, that was Badger Hill. There's a slightly different situation there. It's very close to the university um, and uh, has recently had those um, res park uh, restrictions put in um, during the working day. Anyway, I think I don't think they I don't think they're 24 hour restrictions. So slightly different to this one, um, but yeah, the similarities in, in terms of those numbers. Okay, any further debate? Is anybody then willing to move the officer's recommendation? 
Councillor Manning? Yeah, can't see any reason not to, can't see any reasons to refuse. Okay. Anybody willing to second? Yeah, Councillor Jagorn. Okay, if there's no further debate there, Gareth, if you're able to. Okay, so it's recommended uh, that uh, permission be granted. Um, uh, with the conditions on page uh, 144 as uh, as amended by the uh, by the printed update in respect of condition number four. Okay, if I could then see all those in favour of the proposal. All those against. So I think that's four, four and three against. So that's approved. Okay, thank you everybody for your time this evening. It's been a quite a long one. Um I'll see you all on Wednesday.